Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ACS PC Day Hour Hardware live stream. Just come on, water head over here. Just a smidge, just good. Let's see what we got going on here. All right, perfect. So, uh, happy Friday. Hopefully, everybody's doing good. Everybody's enjoying a positive and productive Friday. Getting ready for the weekend. And uh, let's see who we have joining us actually for today's stream. So, we've got Michael joining us. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us for today's stream. Uh, <laughs> hey, Michael. Uh, we've got Night uh, Whisperer, man. Fantastic. Thanks for joining us here on the stream as well. We've got Michael, uh, another Michael joining us, Tech joining us, uh, Wes over at Lano C as well joining us, fantastic to have you here, uh, Flying PJ, uh, don't know if I've had you recently on the stream, so thanks for joining us here on the stream, thanks so much for joining us out, and uh, we've also got uh, PG PCs, and uh, let's go ahead and tone down that uh, intro audio, we'll get ready to go, and we'll be set there, all right there, um, Hey, Snap, happy to have you here, man. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. And for sure, a chair for JJ. I'm going to go uh, and double check and see if uh, we can get get my uh, my uh, just a chair, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future here. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Michael's letting us know audio is a little bit low. So why don't you guys let me know if audio is still a little bit low. I can go ahead and bring that up a smidge. So I uh, tuned it up there. I don't want to make it too hot for you guys. But let me know how the audio is going and we'll be good to go. All right. Um, Let's see, quick question. Let's just see here. We got one quick question before we get things started uh, from, let's see, Blueberry Dingo right there is asking, as I got an RTX 2050 when I upgrade, thinking about a power color Hellhound R RX 67 NXT. Hopefully you'll be thinking about an Asus graphics card as an alternative, as we do actually offer AMD series-based graphics cards um, or a, a 6700 XT. Are they good cards? What CPU and motherboard should I consider pairing with it? So um, when you talk about a motherboard pairing, I think it really depends on your budget, your form factor, kind of all those different pieces, right? Um, we're actually going to be showing a couple of different promotions that we have right now regarding for Intel and AMD based platforms. So, so whether you're looking to maybe go into socket 1700 or socket AM5, we actually have a number of different promotions uh, going on. So those might be of interest for you if you're looking to build on a kind of a foundation. Um, I think for AM5, for the vast majority of people, B650 is a really great foundation. So I think something like our Tough Gaming B650 motherboard or RG Strix B650-A are great options uh, without being too expensive, really give you a great balance of spec and features and functions. On the GPU side, I would also probably consider taking a look at maybe our Tough Gaming or our Dual Series for the Radeon RX if that's what you're looking at. Although I think within the GPU class that you're probably looking at, um, you know, the, the 4060, the 4060 Ti are also very, very solid. Um, and of course, there's always a balancing act in terms of the games you're playing, whether or not you're going to take advantage of things like DLSS, although uh, AMD, of course, has FSR. Uh, DLSS is more prevalent in, I think, a wider range of games. Plus, you also do technically have um, frame generation support, which is available there. Well, that's only been recently introduced on the AMD side and has far less game integration. Uh, but either which way, we've got both samples. So I would take a look at the promo section that we're going to talk about. Hopefully that'll help you out and we'll be good to go there. So let's get ready to jump into it, guys. Uh, first and foremost, we always like to talk a little bit about our UEFA BIOS updates. On that side, uh, we do have actually quite a number of updates, um, but it's pretty much going to be a continuation of what we had in the past. So that's going to pretty much be focusing on socket 1700 series motherboards that we're seeing that introduction to that new Intel microcode that we discussed previously, uh, which also introduced essentially the CEP performance-based option. So uh, the CEP performance-based tuning parameter is really only for those of you that are going to be running a system without uh, a K-series CPU. So if you're essentially looking at something like a um, you know, like a 14600 non-K, take for instance, um, or these K-series, non-K-series CPUs, you can essentially see increased performance. Um, I won't recap this last week because I covered already last week in terms of how you can go through and double check that. But if you want to check the entirety of the motherboards that have seen this corresponding update, just make sure to be part of our PC DIY group. We'll have a link to essentially all of the boards that saw the update this week, as well as, of course, you can check um, postings from previous weeks if you want to see recent introductions, but you can always head over to your support page. Um, just for reference, uh, the number of boards that we had for this week, um, I think is totaling 
Uh, let me see right here. It's probably over 105, so quite a number. Again, this spans across B6, uh, B760, uh, Z690, Z790, um, and H series based chipsets that are essentially all getting these up darts. Even actually W680, which is of course the workstation Beery's counterpart, also saw these corresponding updates. So pretty much the way you want to think about it is going to be for socket 1700 series. Again, if you're not running, uh, excuse me, if you are running a K series part, don't worry about this. Uh, if you're running essentially a non K series part and you're maybe looking to be able to get even a little bit more performance, then it would probably pay attention to this update. So that covers the UEFI BIOS updates on that side. So well, let's quickly just see if we got another question that might have popped in right there. Um, so, hey, Tech505, happy to have you here, man. Thanks for joining us again. So, Blueberry follows up and says, this will be my first build. I have a pre-built at the moment. So, I think everybody in the chat, let's go ahead and give them a little bit of a round of applause. Fantastic. Always cool to be able to usher in another first-time builder into the pre-CDIY uh, builders community. Um, I would definitely recommend consider checking out our PCDIY group. It's linked. If you're checking us out on YouTube, you can see it uh, linked in the description. Um, it's a great community that we have of builders. So, if you have questions on your build and how to go about it, uh, tips, tricks, and insights, we have an amazing community of over 50,000 members that can give you some insight. Plus, I've got lots of resources that we've posted in there, um, links to our guides and kind of setup configuration and different details like that. Um, you can also probably check some of the prior live streams where we've actually done some recent kind of build recommendation targets. Or if you're maybe looking for a build list, uh, feel free to go ahead and post in that and we can definitely share some guidance with you. Again, I think the most important thing is you want to probably want to block out what's your relative budget. And then the second one that a lot of people don't account for is what's your form factor preference? Do you want to build in something like a more compact micro ATX chassis or do you want to build in an ATX chassis? Because that's going to generally start to determine certain components, whether they're going to be limited or be supported. And it will also influence certain aspects from the budget perspective as sometimes certain components that fit within certain form factors are going to lead more towards one price point than they would towards another. Okay, so just be mindful of that. All right. Um, Hey, Corey, uh, thanks for your feedback. We really only cover um, uh, PCDIY components on this stream. We don't actually cover any of our SPG system components. Uh, if you have any questions, though, feel free to reach out to our service and support team if you have questions on functionality, or you can check out also the ROG Discord, which has a lot of laptop owners in there. But I would tell you that um, crashing just in general, I mean, it, it happens on both laptops and happens on desktops. In most situations, most crashes are actually operating system based. So it's something that maybe you've installed. It could be a conflicting driver. Um, the best thing you want to start to look at is probably going to be looking at things like your Windows reliability monitor. Um, and that will help to maybe set a foundation to help you know what's actually potentially causing your trash. And then if it's something that was recently that only started to come up versus has been maybe coming on excuse me, has been consistently experienced, it might be maybe linked to something like an update. So maybe it might have been a Windows update or a driver or something you might have installed. And you might want to go back and use something like Windows Restore to do an A and B test. So essentially, if I roll back to before that update got applied, do I see the same experience? But the vast majority of situations, um, usually you're not looking at hardware related faults, you're actually generally looking at operating system related faults, whether that's something you've done indirectly or directly, or whether it's done through an update that you weren't aware of. Um, that's where you have to kind of really start to look at your debug process. So my recommendation, take a look at your Windows reliability monitor, take a look at your event viewer, and that can start you down the pathway of looking at some stuff. You can also use the My Asus app uh, within your laptop to actually run some diagnostic functions uh, if you're looking for that. Okay. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, continue things further. Uh, introvert alert, man. Happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us all the way from Australia, man. Very cool. Thanks so much. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look here at our next update. So I think next update, um, what are we going to touch on? Uh, let's go ahead and quickly, I guess, note on uh, these quick promo links for you guys. So just if anybody's interested in a couple of things, then we can touch on those. So give me one second to bring these links up here. And so uh, we've got some current promos that we're running with our friends right now over at uh, Newegg. And so if anybody's interested in picking up some potential hardware configurations, we do actually have two sets of promotions that are going on right now. So one is going to be uh, for Intel and the other one's going to be for AMD. Let me go ahead and actually swap this background right here really quick. Maybe something a little bit different. Yeah, let's go with that. All right. So you'll see right here, you have this Intel combo builder. So you see that there's a wide range of different configurations and options. Take for instance, right here, you've got this Z690-E motherboard, a 1400K with some Corsair memory. Here's a G-Skill. Here's a 14600K and a Z790-E. 
Here's a dash F with the 12900K and of course a different set of memory configurations. So you'll see different relative savings from $200 to $85, $65. Um, but you can see that there's tons of different options right here, uh, depending on the motherboard, the processor, the memory, you can see where your correlating kind of price reductions are. So set up to $70, up to 94, up to 10, 4, 28, 40, 10, 30, and 10. So you can see it's very easy. You can just go through matrix through, configure uh, your build accordingly and see where your kind of savings comes through. So if you're looking at a potential kind of upgrade, it might be kind of cool for you to check out. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that link in the chat for those of you might be interested on the Intel side of the fence. Also, I just give a soft plug. Um, one cool thing, especially about the 14th gen series processors is you saw Intel recently announced um, that there will be essentially forthcoming updates to the Intel APO technology to also prior generation series CPUs. So originally it was released only to be able to allow for performance enhancements for select games um, under the 14th gen series processors, but it's now actually being backported to two prior generations. So uh, you will actually be able to leverage APO in a wider range of games on also other series processors. So that's pretty cool because the performance uplift for APO it is pretty notable. And if you're not aware, essentially what APO is doing is uh, essentially intelligent adjustment to how the processor works in relation to the game engine. So take for instance, while Intel's already done a really great job with what's called the thread direct, manage your P cores and your E cores. So your P cores are your performance cores on the CPU and your E cores are your kind of multi-threaded, more power efficient cores that are on the platform. In some situations, it could be advantageous to maybe disable the E cores and be able to essentially increase performance, right? By then maximizing the, the power headroom and the clock boosting performance as when you actually add in your E cores, you're taking away a little bit of voltage and that can affect actually clock boosting and some other characteristics. So. APO will actually automatically do this for you, where traditionally, if you wanted to be able to make adjustments like this, you'd have to go into the UEFI, disable, reboot. It would be a little bit more compl complicated to be able to kind of conditionally be able to take advantage of these configuration adjustments based on the game engine. But here, they're essentially creating like a, um, a flagging system that once that game engine is detected, if it actually supports a benefit, it can be toggled on and off and on, and you can actually see a noticeable performance increase. So it's pretty cool. And then that will be retroactively being rolled out to two other series CPUs. So I think that's a nice addition. Um, beyond that, on the AMD side, for those of you looking for AMD, these are gonna pretty much be all on the AM4 as well as AM5 uh, based platform. So you actually have the older platform, which is still great on AM4. It's going to be a bit cheaper. It's going to be DDR4, PCI Express Gen 4 support. Um, still a very good platform, but of course it's end of life, although AMD did recently issue a couple of still new CPU updates to it. So still a very, very solid platform if you're more on a constrained budget. If you're looking a little bit more towards higher level of performance and a longer pathway towards upgradability, then AM5 is going to be a great option for you. And again, you have the same type of combo structure available to you. So you can just go through, select your combo configurations and see what's going to work best for you for your budget. So I'm going to drop those in the chat and we're good, good to go from there. A lot of people that I think are always wondering like, hey, where do I start? Um, my additional recommendation, I would say, like I said, a lot of times, I think this is a really solid board here with the B650-A. Again, really good foundation in terms of the IO um, specification support. Easy some nice things like this board is going to have um, the Q release ejection mechanism. So you can easily eject your graphics card. You got Wi-Fi 6E. You can have USB-C that's on here. Um, so really solid option, quite a number of M.2 slots that are going to be on that board as well. So I think that's a good option. I also am a big fan of the tough gaming model, which is going to be pretty similar in terms of the price point. But if you want to go with your more kind of traditional black themed base board, um, this is a very solid option. Again, 2.5 gig Wi-Fi 6 USB-C. It's going to be on here. Good M.2 expansion. So two solid kind of starting points. And of course you can go higher. Um, for anybody that always asks too, is they go like, am I going to be limited by picking a more entry board if I want to go to higher end CPUs? No. Uh, whether you went even with something like a 7900X or 7950X, which would really be for more for like a professional workload than necessarily a kind of gaming related focus, you could still run those on those entry boards. The power delivery design, uh, the UEFI BIOS, the board topology, uh, there's no issues running those higher end CPUs, even on the most entry level series boards on that side. So you're okay on that side. All right. So. Let me go ahead and drop those links in the chat for you guys. Give me one second here. So that's going to be for AMD and then we're going to be for Intel. And uh, we'll quickly take a look here and see if we had any quick questions that kind of came up there. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and see. Hey, Corey, uh, like I noted, if you have more issues, um, it sounds like you probably need to reach out to the service support team. I wouldn't try to reach out for support here. If you've got more complicated issue 
just reach out to our service and support team. Uh, you can reach us via live chat. You can use that MySeus app on a mobile product, or you can, of course, uh, go via email or via our contact phone number, either which way, so they can assist you in helping you to kind of resolve whatever problem is that you have with your, your, your laptop, okay? Um, so let me see uh, right here. 904 goes, it's just joined. Has he discussed any updates on the UCDM? No, because there's no updates to discuss. We've already talked about that. Um, we're going to continue to keep kind of rolling out uh, production. I think for probably the most majority users, you probably won't probably see stock that will be more easy in terms of kind of readily being readily available probably until towards the end of this month. So as we start to get to closer to the ends of this month and we start getting into early April, you'll start to see, I think, a higher level of inventory available across the channel partners. And we're also still seeing that deployment across some channel partners. Take, for instance, Amazon wasn't part of the initial deployment, but they will be coming on board with their inventory allocation as well. So um, that's just going to normally continue to progress. So it's just going to continue to be a process of just monitoring the confirmed ETL partners that we've noted um, and just being mindful of that. Um, I would recommend for some ETL partners that offer notification systems, whether it's on ASUS store or parties like Newegg to take advantage of that. Amazon doesn't currently offer that, so it's a little bit harder. You have to kind of be more active at trying to monitor it. Um, but if you want to take advantage of notification systems, do that so that once those products come into stock, you can be notified of when it comes, uh, when it's available, okay? All right. Hey, Carl, thanks for being Team ROG, man. Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of the formula. I really love the ID design on that board. Um, it's really one of my kind of favorite looking boards. I love the kind of duality and that really kind of cool NZVM finish that that board has. So thanks for being uh, Team Crosshair, Team ROG, man. Pretty cool. All right, so I think beyond that, we're going to just quickly touch on a couple of other, I think, cool promos that we have just going on. Um, I won't spend too much time on these. So just I think some of these are kind of cool and interesting. Uh, for some of you might be interested in a couple things, and then we're going to get to talking about some of the new products that we have, all right? So I think one right here is we have the ROG Ryu. So this is gonna be our course, along with the Ryu Gen 3, those are our two flagship AIOs. And so right now we have a price reduction on the Ryu 3. Um, there's a couple of variations of it. I haven't noted all of them, but I believe actually both the 240 and the 360, the white and the black are actually in a combination of different re price reductions on Senshi on sale. So you see right here, the 240, it's $40 price savings. This is featuring the latest uh, eighth generation uh, Asa Tech based pump design. Um, it's got a vacuum coated lens, which is actually really nice in terms of kind of the fit and the finish. And it's much more resistant to scratches than many of the kind of acrylic layered displays. This entire housing is also made out of metal. It's actually a knurled metal finish, which is, feels really, really, really premium. Um, and then just, it also has a unique design. Uh, there's no other company that has something like this where traditionally you have like a screen or maybe just like a fixed animation. This is actually our anime matrix pixel based display. So you can customize this. You can do things like render out actually like stats. So like temperature or clock speed, but you can also have kind of specialized animated um, visuals that you can put onto the actual pump housing as well. So great unit 240 is going to be a really nice balance in terms of pretty much fitting just about any type of chassis versus 360 where you might have to have that type of radiator support so that's going to be the ryu 3 uh, again saves right now 40 bucks but uh there is also going to be like i said uh other variants of this that we do have on promotion so you can see right here here's the white model the white model is actually 50 dollars off versus 40 dollars off so same exact unit but all in white Looks absolutely fantastic, I think, for white base builds, especially with that nice metal knurled housing. Most of the units on the market are going to be plastic. Um, just really nice performance base unit, okay? Uh, we also have the 360, as you can see right there. 360 is $60 off, so even uh, greater savings. This is a really great choice. Some people do also overbuy coolers, so I do want to make that a point. Some people think just because I have... Uh, 70, 7900X or I have a 1400K or 39K, I have to buy a 360. 100% that's not the case. Um, you can go back and watch our live streams where we've done real full on the fly performance tuning with overclocking, running game engines. And the reality is that your actual nominal power draw um, that you have to handle for CPU when you're talking about desktop productivity and gaming is usually between about 80 to 200 watts. Um, sometimes when you're watching some media, they're talking about reviewing a product, they're using like a benchmark of using something like Blender for like an hour and saying the CPU runs at X temperature. While that's a valid data point, you do want to keep in mind that that's just not realistic when you talk about a gaming based scenario. So while that's a valid temperature point to communicate that the CPU can reach, you'll never see that temperature when you're talking about actual gaming loads. It's not even actually analogous to really being able to describe it as a worst case scenario because you wouldn't see that under any gaming scenario. So it really would only be if you're using maybe more professional applications 
that you'd have to consider that type of heat dissipation requirement. Um, so in that respect, you can actually readily cool even higher parts, even overclocked with like a 240 millimeter or even our high performance tower heatsink. And we've actually shown that again in our prior streams. If you guys want to check out like our AIOC demo, which we've done with the 12900K, the 1300K and the 1400K. Okay, so just some feedback on that. Um, we also have a live performance demo that included uh, testing here with the Ryu, excuse me, with the Ryu Gen, I think 240, and then we also did one with the Ryu uh, 360. Uh, GT502, one of my favorite chassis that we have in our lineup. It's our split chamber chassis. Great for those larger kind of more panorama based builds or maybe water cooled builds. I believe Tech505, who's here in the chat, he's built with this system, uh, with this chassis. It's really flexible. It's got a lot of versatility in terms of where you can mount things. Sue Min, who is also joining us here in the chat, is also built with this. And again, nice $20 savings. So it's already, I think, very reasonable at its $150 price point. Excuse me, $170 price point, but now at $150. And the white, you'll also see is $25 off. And compared to some other chassis on the market, this is really actually all white. So um, the entire interior is all white. The cables are all white. It has handles, which is really nice for moving or lifting your chassis. Not a lot of chassis have that. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, the GT502. So check that one out. Uh, our Tough Gaming uh, TF120 fans are on sale, both the single pack and the triple pack. Triple pack is already a good deal at $60. It comes with three fans that have outstanding berry performance. You can buy actually much more expensive fans than this. You can buy fans that cost you $100, $150, and that will actually come with a lower performing bearing than the bearing that we use here, the advanced FDB bearing that's rated here. This is a 250,000 hour rated bearing. Uh, some of the more common fans on the market, even higher end RGB fans, will sometimes be using around an 80K rated bearing. So just to show you, um, you're not compromising, I think, of the overall kind of reliability. It's a dual LED array. Um, you can get them in white, you can get them in black, and they come with this really nice included uh, RGB controller, which actually is much nicer than a lot of the more basic entries on the offerings where you have more modes, more presets, and there's no proprietary controllers with any of these. This is just standard three pin connectivity, so it'll work on any motherboard as long as it has an ARGB header, um, you're good to go. And even if you don't have an ARGB header, you could just use the controller to actually control all the RGB lighting. So again, nice little price saving, 17 bucks off from its normal price of $60. Um, Tough Gaming LC2, this is our most entry level cooler that came out not that long ago, 30 bucks off. So right now, $120, this is a great unit and you can definitely cool a 1300K, 1400K. I've also done full live stream performance testing with the 1300K and the 1400K with this. I was showing overclocking, you know, running per core overclocking 6.1, 6.2 gigahertz, um, being able to see the performance delta and this unit can definitely do it. I also, that's actually the cooler I have right here. I like the decoupled pump if you really care about noise. I would unquestionably say it's the quietest AIO that we offer in regard in regards to pump noise because the pump is decoupled right here. Okay. Um, B650A is on sale right now, 20 bucks. So normally from 280 to 260. Great choice if you're looking for a Ryzen based build. All right. Um, tough, tough gaming, 1000 watt series power supply, 20 bucks off from 190 to 170. Great choice for just a high performance based build. Plus the cable quality on here is outstanding. Some of the best inbox cables on the market, bar none. They have, they're called what's called fully etched and modular. Really nice and clean design um, in terms of these cables. They're soft, they're malleable, they're easy to run and work with. I'm a really big fan. So again, nice little savings there. Um, I believe also the 850 and the 750 are on sale. Don't hold me to that, but you can double check. I, I'm pretty sure the 750 for sure is on sale and the 1000 watt is on sale. Um, the GT501. Uh, another great chassis that we offer, full cold rolled steel on this. This chassis feels great. If you want to see some awesome builds, Sneff was in here. Sneff has done a build, and there's quite a number of people that you can see build inspiration in the PCDIY group that have used this chassis. Again, for 50 bucks off, fantastic choice. It'll give you lots of room, really rigid, really great, lots of airflow, comes already with fans. Great chassis to build in, really easy. It's got a lot of space in the back for cables. So if you don't care about cable management, you can pretty much just stuff it in there, put the panel in then you're done, good to go. Um, that's nice, 50 bucks off. I think that's a great, great um, option right there. Um, and the last couple of ones just right here for you guys. Um, monitor, this is the PA. 3.4 BCNV, so this is going to be a 13, uh, excuse me, 
3800R curvature, so minimal in terms of the curvature, just a little bit, but it's going to have USB-C with 96 power delivery. It's going to have USB 3.2 in terms of pass-through support. It has daisy chain support, has RJ45 integrated if you want to integrate your laptop, six color axis calibration. It's factory calibrated in a 3440 by 40 resolution on there. So a uh, great choice if you're looking just for a display that's going to be color accurate, immersive, dynamic, really great for productivity. Uh, of course, being on the pro art side, we do have some high refresh rate offerings. This is not really for those that are on the gamer camp, or maybe you're only doing a moderate amount of gaming, maybe games that are really only kind of in that 60 FPS based range, then this would be a great choice for you. But 70 bucks off, I think a really nice price point, right? Uh, going from 599 to 530. I wanted to bring that one up. Uh, similarly, this is another pro art based display going down from 630 to 560. So $70 off this one being 4k. So again, 30, 30, essentially 32 inches, 31.5, 4k resolution, outstanding factory calibration, um, you know, 98% DCI-P3. You also get the USB-C with the 96 watt power delivery, um, the USB 3.2 hub, um, the MST support. And if you're wondering what MST means, it's daisy chain support. So that means you can actually connect two of these side by side with one cable, as opposed to having to connect back to your graphics card. So that actually allows you to reduce your actual cable clutter uh, in cable management because you can go from monitor to monitor. Um, so that's pretty slick. So that's going to be a nice savings there. Um, our A21 chassis, this one we just recently came out with. It's our high airflow micro ATX chassis. Really versatile, really flexible in terms of what you can put in here. There's pretty much no hardware limitation. You can fit big graphics cards. Um, you can fit 360 millimeter AOs. We have it in white and black. Both of them are $10 off. Um, really nice and clean, great airflow chassis. And it also supports BTF based motherboards. So in the future, if we release BTF micro ATX based motherboards, then you can support that one. Uh, Tough Gaming LC2 240 is on sale, 25 bucks off, so $95. And then I've got two routers for you, the GSAX5400. This is a great dual band based router. If you're looking to be able to step up to 500 Wi-Fi 6, and you also wanna be able to support AI mesh later, um, this is quite flexible in terms that you can still be able to pair two of these together to be able to get greater coverage. It has, um, excuse me, um, a modern 1.5 gigahertz tri-core quad processor. So that's probably much faster than your more basic routers that have like a dual core based processor. Um, and you're still going to, of course, get your phys physical Ethernet and uh, USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports on there. So. That's, I think, a solid option right there. And last but not least, maybe my favorite router from like a price to performance standpoint, it's going to be this guy, which is going to be the uh, AX89X. Oh, it already actually sold out. It sold out, $50 off. That's too good of a deal. Um, it sold out. So I'm not even gonna talk about it because it sold out. All right, so um, now with our deals out of the way, let me quickly see if we got any good questions. If not, we're gonna get into the new products and we will go from there. Um, Carl asked a question right here as he goes, is there any real benefit um, over a 280 to a 360. So I think your question you're asking is, if you had a 280 millimeter radiator versus a 360 millimeter radiator, um, we actually offer both. We have an ROG Strix 280 and then we have a 360. In most situations, no. Um, it, it really gets a little bit more complicated because what will probably be more of a combination of factors is gonna be the pump speed, um, also going to be factors, the radiator thickness, right? Like, is it 25 millimeters? Is it 27 millimeters? Is it larger than 27 millimeters? Those are all going to be generally more important. And the fan is actually pretty influential just because you have a 140 millimeter van versus a 120 millimeter fan doesn't mean really anything. Um, the static pressure performance and the airflow performance are going to be far more important in terms of really dictating whether or not one would be advantageous of the other on paper. If let's say we have very good static pressure good airflow, the same size uh, diameter for the actual radiators and, and everything else kind of being, let's say, the same, the relative performance is going to be pretty much comparable. I would say it's almost a wash between the 140 and the 360. So then it kind of comes down to more so compatibility. I would say it's going to be much actually more common to probably be able to support a 360 than a 280 because uh, 280 being a 140, there's going to be less chassis that readily support a radiator uh, with essentially a 280 millimeter configuration, especially at the top. So um, I would say it's probably more advantageous to look at 240s and 360s than it would be at 280s, although it's a very solid and very performant product and it can pretty much be very competitive with the 360 in terms of its overall relative performance. Okay. All right. Um, somebody noted the handles are nice in terms of the GT502, right? 
Um, question right here is introvert. Hey JJ, for the new BTF motherboards that have both a three by eight pin power connectors and one 12 volt type power connector on the back, can you power a 4090 with the three eight pin power connectors? That's all dependent on your GPU. So uh, your GPU design will designate whether or not it's designed to essentially accommodate three or by four, right? Um, so that would be ultimately determined by that. So the baseline requirement, right, from NVIDIA would be that 450 watts, right, which would be accomplished from that three by eight or that single 12 volt. Um, generally though, for any 40 series GPU on the higher end side, you would just wanna use the 12 volt high power connector and not the legacy three by eight pin. Um, that would be my recommendation, but that choice is up to you depending on whether the motherboard has that design accommodation, right? So uh, for anybody that's asking, let me see if I can bring up the model right here because I think I have our uh, BTF uh, tough gaming board that I can probably use. Um, let me see here. Do I have it over here? And uh, yeah, so uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, these will be actually coming out in the not too distant future. I'm hoping to actually do hopefully a live um, build uh, for actually our BTF. Um, so stay tuned for that if that's something you're interested in. But here's an example of one of the BTF boards. This will be the first BTF board that we will be putting out in terms of our motherboard, our chassis, and our graphics card. So as we previously noted, we're going to launch the Tough Gaming C790 BTF Wi-Fi motherboard along with our GT302 chassis and then the um, Tough Gaming uh, GeForce RTX 4070 Ti Super. So that will be a kind of triple pairing together, all of those products to be able to enable the BTF-based ecosystem. Um, now, the big thing you'll notice is essentially all of the connectors have been moved to the back with the exception of, of course, the uh, primary CPU, pan, uh, CPU fan power connector. Um, but if we go all the way to the back of the motherboard, you'll see the connectors right here on the back, they're all present there. So your EPS, your CPU, your fans, right? Your 24 pin, your USB-C, your legacy USB-3, the 12 volt high power, and then your auxiliary PCIe uh, eight pin power connectors. So you would just connect into that depending on which graphics card configuration and which corresponding hardware you're going to be utilizing. So if you weren't aware, that is what he's talking about when he's asking about BTF, okay? So that's gonna be uh, BTF there. Uh, Michael goes, oh cool, JJ building BTF. Yes, um, hopefully do a live build right there. So we'll be kind of going along with that. Um, JB goes, since LG just announced a 32 4K monitor, they're coming out with dual mode. Yeah, Jay, we actually already announced that monitor at CES. So that's nothing new. We had already made an announcement. That is gonna be the ROG Swift uh, PG32 UCDP. So we already launched the ROG Swift PG32 UCDM, which that was gonna, that's our essentially QD OLED base offering, but then we're also gonna be offering an, a W OLED base offering. Um, to my knowledge, actually Asus is gonna be the only manufacturer on the market that will actually offer both of those panels. Um, every other company is kind of either doing one or the other, um, but Asus actually will offer both. We will give you either the UCDP, which would be the 4K 32 inch, with the FHD toggle to 480 hertz and then is using the third gen w, uh, w OLED MLA based panel technology or do you want to go with the QD OLED um, latest generation Samsung based panel which is same thing it's 32 inches it's 4k it's 240 hertz but it doesn't have an FHD toggle um, there are some respected differences if you're wondering more about those check out our PCDIY group or check out our prior CES stream where we actually talked about both of the models and how they differ between the two okay um, let me see right here. Um, Michael is going, uh, QD is Samsung. That's correct. So, yes, the UCDM is going to be a QD OLED, the latest generation QD OLED panel. And then the UCDP is going to be the latest LG W OLED base panel. Okay. Um, Kyle, excuse me, Carl goes, I'm trying to do an ITX build with the RG Strix X570-i gaming, but can't find it anywhere in stock. Are they still manufactured? No. Um, the vast majority of actually mini ITX boards have already gone a a EOL um, for actually the AM5, the AM4 based platform. Um, I don't actually think that we have anything in active production. Let me quickly see if I can check my, um, my active production price list. Give me one second from this month, but I know um, from the last time I checked it, I don't remember seeing one on there. So let me go check here quickly. So this is from February and I'm pretty sure um, we actually don't have one right now. 
So yeah, you would be hard, hard struggle. There might be maybe some new old stock of some board from some manufacturer, excuse me, from, um, from some chipset, um, but that's gonna vary depending on the e-tailer. But let me go over here to AM4. And let me check here. So AM4, do I have one? left uh b550 so right now on am4 in general in terms of active production we have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen we have 13 board no excuse me 16 boards uh, we actually have quite a bit still that are all active production but no mini itx so in terms of mini itx um yeah you know you can maybe look for the b450 uh, version or the maybe the B550-I I would maybe look for that that's a really good option the B550-I and we had still pretty good kind of aging inventory of that so there still might be maybe some places that have new old stock of that board but from us on the production standpoint we're no longer actively producing a, an AM4 mini ITX based board okay all right all right so um let me go ahead and we'll get ready to start getting in new products but let me answer i guess one other question that we have right here so um narrative goes can we expect similar features on the ucdp to the ucdm such as the aspect ratio control the 24.5 and the 27 in yeah i know a lot of people actually really like that and unlike a certain competitor um, that also had essentially different modes we actually allowed for different resizing options because some of them if you don't allow for correct resizing options it would be kind of weird because if you went down to a different size the diagonal um, presentation would be like 15 and a half inches or something like that which is I think it undercuts part of the value of having that type of support. Um, we're not ready to fully disclose the entirety of that information. So all I can tell you is just make sure to keep tuned. But um, for most situations, when it comes to our OSD level of functionality that we're looking to implement, we are looking to try to maintain a parity level of feature set. So yes, I would tentatively say that is on target, but I can't give you a full confirmation of that. We'll have more full confirmation notes once we're actually ready to release that monitor, but that is something that we are looking to maintain, okay? All right. Um, all right, one la uh, we'll go with one more question. Is 70 to 80 degrees okay on a 2060? Um, it depends on the design of the graphics card. Different graphics cards have different kind of headroom targets based on their heatsink design, right? The fans that they have, and even, of course, your ambient environment, right? Um, I would say it's not unreasonable, uh, but it's hard to know, right? With specifically knowing what model you have, it would be hard to know how whether or not you're kind of in the right performance target or you're not in the right performance target, if that kind of makes sense, right? Um, some GPUs are going to be much more performant than others, right? So depending on that, that would really be a dictator as far as whether or not you would kind of say that it's normal. Um, so let me see if I can bring up like, let me show you this as like an example. Um, let me see if I still, I don't know if I still have this data here from a while ago, but if we kind of look here on, let me see right here. Yeah, I don't still have it up here. But take, for instance, on your, your temperature data, right? Um, on the 2060, if I remember correctly, the, you know, your nominal temperature probably for most GPUs should probably be, I'd say around probably like 65 to about 70 degrees, right? Um, now, keep in mind, some people monitor hotspot. Technically, I don't like to discuss hotspot because it's not a temperature that the user should actually really be knowledgeable about. It's a metric that's utilized by the vBIOS and by the GPU vendor to essentially help to manage how the actual clock boosting behavior is. But some users, they use utilities to force expose it and to then they start talking about, is this okay, is it not okay? Because it seems so much hotter, but there's a reason why it's the hotspot. It's the hotspot and it's not the average representation of what the temperature is. So your average temperature, um, like I said, as long as you're probably in that 65 to 70 degree-ish range, I'd say you're entirely fine. I really wouldn't be worried. If you really wanna take a look and kind of make sure that you're, I guess, in a safe marker, what you can always do is you can go to the manufacturer's website. So um, let me go ahead and see if we bring up here NVIDIA's site, um, if I can bring up the information. So let me go ahead and go here and we can go, let's see if we can find it here. 
Yeah, so you could actually look up the temperature. So this is actually the chart take, for instance, and you'll see right here that there's a thermal and power spec information. And you can actually see right here that their recommended kind of max GPU temperature is gonna be 88. So as long as your part is pretty much underneath that, you're fine, right? Some people argue that you have to be at 65 degrees. It's not, as long as you're underneath that target power, excuse me, as long as you're underneath that target temperature, the GPU will operate fine. Now that can affect some of the boosting behavior, which means that you might be losing a little bit of performance if it's a little bit hotter than a little bit cooler. But again, I can't tell you what you should be getting in terms of your temperature without really knowing your model. Cause again, some models are gonna have much better coolers than other models. So it might be entirely normal for one to hit closer to 80 degrees than another card, which might be literally 60 degrees because of the difference within the cooler design, okay? All right, um, so with that, let's go ahead and start to go into our actually new products. Um, again, if we have more questions, feel free to go ahead and drop them in. I'll do my best to answer them as we go through there, okay? So let me go ahead and bring this up. Give me one second here. Um, narrative goes, uh, any possibility of a glossy finish Technically, no, um, because it's entirely different designs. Um, I wouldn't actually state that the UCDM is technically glossy. Um, it's more that I would probably say that it's a semi-gloss, and that's predominantly from the fact that it's a QD OLED-based panel, so it doesn't have a polarizer in the same way that a W OLED panel. So it's inherent to the production process, right? So a W OLED inherently is going to have a polarizer, which actually gives it an advantage, right? It doesn't tend to have kind of gray blacks uh, with ambient lighting that of course can't be reduced or eliminated because you don't have a polarizer like on the UCDM, right? So there's an advantage, but there's a disadvantage, right? Some people prefer it from a clarity perspective, but no, right now we are intending to maintain um, our AR type of matte um, polarizer, which is the standard for the production for the uh, UCDP. So we don't have any changes in that respect. Um, we've had very good feedback from the people that have already seen that on our other WLED monitors, whether it's our you know, uh, 42 or 48 inch or 27 inch or the 34 inch that we recently launched. Um, we do know that there are some people that want glossy and we are evaluating other types of offerings maybe for later in the year, but right now that's all under design review. It's not even something that we would say expect this other offering from us, but it is something that we are evaluating. Okay. All right. So let's get ready to go into our new items, guys. Um, let me bring up our first item here. And we're going to talk about what is going to be, it's going to be, that's right. It's going to be a cooler and it's going to be an AIO. So let's get into our first one. This is going to be for the uh, ProArt LC420. All right. And let me bring up my respective pricing information right here. Let me bring this up. All right, there we go. So this is gonna be our first product. So this is gonna be the ProArt LC420. It'll be coming at $269.99, essentially $270 uh, for this. So this will actually be our first um, 420 millimeter based uh, cooling product. So we have not previously offered. We've pretty much had a 120, we've had 240, we've had 280, and we now have 360s, of course, um, but we haven't done a 420. So this will be our first 420 millimeter based product. Now it's important to note that 420s do present a little bit more of a challenge in terms of relative interoperability and compatibility. Um, that's because not many chassis actually support this. That's the reason why initially we didn't decide to release a product that actually had a, um, excuse me, the, that offered uh, 420 millimeter base radiator configuration. Um, but now we are happy to finally be able to offer this. Um, of course, this would complement something like, let's say our um, PA602 chassis, which of course supports 420 millimeter based um, cooling solutions. So here you'll actually see it installed inside of our PA602. So this is going to be an option really for those of you that are looking for the most kind of highest levels of cooling performance, right? So you're running more sustained, heavy multi-threaded workloads where you need a higher level of thermal dissipation performance, right? So uh, let me go ahead and actually just bring up some images here and I'll bring up that video separately. So uh, give me a second here. So 
So you'll see here's the primary pump housing. The pump housing actually does have an LED based notification system. Normally for most products, we don't have any type of RGB lighting or lighting on the product. Here, this is just a minimal lighting that's on here. It's not RGB. Um, it's purely to be able to have actually align with a load indicator. So you could use this for like CPU load or for temperature for other options that you could map inside of the actual utility software. So if you want to be able to customize that, you can. If you also just want to disable the lighting, you can entirely go that route if you want to as well. Um, the uh, housing, I think, is really refined, really clean, very minimal. It really defines the same type of language that we have in terms of ID design as our other types of ProArp series products. Um, now, in terms of this, this, of course, is going to be a larger format radiator. It does include, I believe we're the only manufacturer on the market that when you talk about the fans, these are Noctua IPPC-based fans. So these are the industrial rated fans. They're black. They look fantastic, but they have outstanding build quality, static pressure, and airflow performance. Uh, if anybody knows, when they bought Noctua fans, they're not inexpensive. So this is part of the reason why this product is going to be more of a premium position product, because you are getting three Noctua IPPC-based fans included with the unit. Um, so compared to some users that might sometimes go buy higher performing fans after the fact, these are pretty much the you know one of the best 140 millimeter fans you can get on the market. So they're already coming included with the actual cooler. All right. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. You can go ahead and customize, of course, fan speed and of course pump speed through the UVFI BIOS uh, if you do want to go ahead and do that. But you don't pretty much need to do that. The pre-fault tuning parameters I think are going to handle you very, very well. And again, I think for the majority of people that probably would be considering this product, it's going to probably be related really more so to users that are going to be doing heavy multi-threaded type of workload scenarios. Um, if you're not doing heavy multi-threaded, could you use this, of course, for gaming related purposes? 100%. But is it going to be really kind of something that you would probably need? I would say no. Um, so again, here you can see it inside of the PA602 chassis, right? Um, quite nice in terms of you can see that nice ID housing, that LED lighting, right? So you're going to be good to go. So that is going to be the P, excuse me, the LC420 inside of the PA602. Um, let me go ahead and make sure to link over the product page for you guys for anybody that wants to check that out. So give me one second here. I'll bring that one up. And if maybe you guys are interested in a live demo of this one too, I can maybe see if I can get a sample of it and do some live kind of benchmark testing and whatnot. But the reality is, again, I've already showed kind of benchmark testing with the Tough Gaming LC2 360, with the Ryu 3 360, and also the Ryu Gen 3. Um, and so this will even be a little bit more performant than that. But again, when you talk about the necessity of it, do you need this to be able to cool any current part? No, it really just comes down to sustaining overall cooling performance over a period of time. That's really the main benefit that you're going to be looking at. Um, conditionally, you do get a little bit of improved what's called boost behavior. So if your cooling solution is quite performant, essentially when the CPU is getting ready to go from a lower P state to a higher P state, so essentially kind of one clock speed to another clock speed, it goes into a burst behavior. If you've got more cooling headroom, you can sometimes see what's called more opportunistic or better boosting behavior. So you can sometimes get a little bit higher sustained clock speeds as they burst through one application to another application to another application. Um, a lot of media don't test for this, so it's hard to know if you're actually seeing that inherent benefit, but that is an inherent benefit of kind of improved cooling performance. Okay, so product page already is up for this guy. Um, this will be a fully channel available SKU. So you'll pretty much see this from any of the standard e-tailers that do carry our products. So a new egg, Amazon, the Asus store, Micro Center, and other channel partners will be carrying the LC420 um, AIO cooler. So that again will be our first 420 base cooling solution. So um, let me go ahead and drop that in the chat. Let's see if we had any quick questions right there. Um, let me see. Michael goes, any plans for more AIO 420s next to the ProArt LC 420? Um, not any immediate plans. We have had some discussion on whether or not we might look to offer a 420 millimeter solution on the ROG line. Again, in reality, do gaming need it? No gamer actually needs even a 360 millimeter AIO, but many gamers just as enthusiasts, they want to get the best cooler. And so they buy it, even though technically you don't need it, right? Um, so it really is kind of something that we felt that inherently wasn't needed if you're really true to the usage scenario. But as we know, just enthusiasts being enthusiasts, sometimes they just want to buy even a higher kind of performing part, right? So from that perspective, we have evaluated 
looking to maybe add in a 420 millimeter solution for ROG. But right now we don't have anything to confirm for you telling you, hey, expect you know, an LC series or a Ryu or Ryu Jin 420 option, but it is something that we're evaluating, okay? Uh, Blueberry goes, the hottest it gets is 74 degrees, and that's when I'm playing Baldur Gate 3. I would say you're fine. Again, that's an older GPU too, so you might also wanna double check. In some situations over time, just through a little bit of vibration, um, you can sometimes have some of these screws become a little bit loose. So sometimes you just might wanna take, you know, a, a screwdriver and tighten up and just make sure that those screws are entirely uh, torqued in there. You don't wanna over torque it because you don't potentially wanna crack anything or damage anything, but just make sure that you haven't had a little bit essentially some of the tension decompress because if you're not getting kind of good contact, that could be a factor. Also at that age, you could evaluate attempting to reapply thermal compound. Most good quality thermal compounds should have a relatively straightforward lifespan of about three to six years on the conservative side. Um, so it's not like something you need to repeat, reapply every year, but depending on the environment, the thermal compound that's used, sometimes after about like a two to three year marker, you might evaluate it. And what I generally do, if you don't do this, um, but in my personal system, whenever I get my GP for the very first time, I run my benchmarking session, I pick about three games, I store essentially a running about 30 minute runtime within different game engines of my temperature, and I use that as a control. So then after six months, I can go back and I can check it. After a year, I can go back and check it. And if all of a sudden after like two years, I notice, hey, originally when I was running these games, I saw my temperature was 60 degrees. And then now two years later, I'm seeing it 74 degrees even though that's still well under kind of my, my thermal target that I have to be concerned with, I'm knowing that that's, that's out of the norm. Essentially, maybe there's something with the thermal compound, maybe my fans aren't running at the right speed. There's some issue I would wanna take a look into. And also it could be as simple as sometimes dust, debris, and dander getting inside the heat sink, so sometimes you might need to clean that out, right? Okay. Um, let me quick see right there. Um, Falchi on low profile and black soon. No, no immediate plans. I know we've had some people ask about that for the Falchi on RX low profile to be in black, but right now we don't have any immediate plans to put, release one in black. Um, is there a, a VRM fan? No, this model does not have a VRM fan like the Ryujin model. Okay. All right, so I think that answers most of those questions. So again, that is gonna be the ProArt LC420 coming in 269, and you should expect to see availability, like I said, shortly. Just make sure to keep in mind that if you are gonna be considering this cooler, you do need to make sure that your chassis does actually support a 420 millimeter base cooler, okay? All right, um, and uh, one other note that I will just kind of put out there, I do think it's important, um, is going to be the actual tube length. The tube length is quite nice on this. This is 450 millimeters. So it's pretty long, really nice and flexible to be able to allow you to kind of do a little bit more kind of like loops or adjustments based on your build. I'd love to let you know, let me know, what do you guys think? Do you prefer having a shorter or do you prefer longer? Uh, for me, I'm really recommending to our team that we try to probably target at a minimum now for 410, if not 420. Um, already, like when we did the Ryogen 3, we extended that out to even a longer base tube length. So a lot of the ones you're going to see now generally are going to be around 400 millimeters. Uh, I think that's a pretty good balance, but I think sometimes even having a little bit more, so like 410, 420 is in that real sweet spot to account for more variation in chassis and gives you a little bit more swoop opportunity, especially if you want to sometimes go underneath maybe memory to the right or to the left-hand side, more so to the right-hand side than to the left. Okay. So just something to be mindful of. Uh, another thing that you do want to keep in mind is going to be the radiator sizing. So you'll notice this is gonna be a 25 millimeter based radiator. Uh, there are sometimes thicker radiators. So we have had coolers that have like been like 27 millimeter, right? And keep in mind that the thicker you make the radiator, sure you can get better performance, but that does also eat into physical top space in your, in your chassis. So whether you front mount a radiator, whether you top mount a radiator, that's additional spacing that you need to account for along with your fans. Um, some chassis will allow you to kind of offset, so move it in front of the hardware, um, but that can also come at the expense of eating a little bit of the visual space of the top of the motherboard too. So just be mindful that um, this is a good spot because 25 means it's pretty much kind of universally compatible, but the thicker you make a radiator, you do have to start to account for more potential compatibility concerns. Okay. All right, um, let's go ahead and go into our next product. Um, so next one, let's go into a display. This is gonna be a ProArt series monitor. Okay, so we got the ProArt 
and this is going to be second. Okay, there we go. All right, so next up is going to be our ProArt PA24 AC RV. Now, this is going to be actually a pretty interesting monitor uh, because it's going to be a little bit smaller, right, in terms of the actual um, dimensions. Now, we already have, of course, much larger displays. We have 27 inches, we have 32 inches, we have 34 inches, right, larger base monitors. Um, but the interesting thing here is that the reason why we have also been offering sometimes smaller but also similarly higher resolution based displays is going to be that um, there can be situations where some some professionals are going to be looking for wanting to have a display that has a higher kind of PPI. And so um, 24 inches at the 1440p resolution that this monitor comes in at actually comes in at a pretty nice PPI. It's 122. So it's going to be sharper, just like we also have had actually 4K at 24 inches, which is a very high PPI, right? Um, and if you're not familiar with PPI, that's essentially your pixels per inch. And that really helps to translate to kind of how sharp things will look on the screen. Essentially, that higher that number that PPI is, the sharper that it will look. And so uh, we generally will usually offer our sharpest displays under our ProArt series because, of course, they're going to be more professionally suited. So let's quickly go ahead and take a look at this monitor. So you'll see right here, it's a 24-inch display, IPS, 1440p in terms of the resolution, very good color accuracy and very good color space performance at 95% DCI-P3. Factory calibrated. Uh, it has what's called six color access control. Most general monitors have three access color control. This is going to be six color access. So that just gives you more gradation and adjustment to be able to dial things in. USB-C with 96 watt power delivery. Um, you also have an integrated uh, hub in terms of USB hub support. Um, and there's also an ambient light sensor, which will make automatic adjustments. As you, you may or may not be aware, um, you can actually, your lighting could affect uh, color rendering. So that can be adjustment in terms of helping you to maximize performance. So um, lastly, if you just head over here in terms of some of our spec to kind of note, you do get a little bit of a bump up in terms of desktop refresh rate performance from 60 to 75 hertz. It'll seem just a little bit smoother as you open up kind of windows, you track your cursor back and forth. Um, it being a Pro Art Series display, it has our standard three-year warranty along with ARR, but you also get a zero bright dot warranty coverage as well uh, for three years. Tons of presets for different types of course content creator scenarios that are going to be available to you. This model also does maintain something that's pretty rare even a monitor on this side, but picture and picture and picture by picture. So if you wanted to input like a mini PC or like a laptop or another device, so you could be watching like a browser or a secondary input feed, you could put that in there and then put it in picture by picture, or picture by picture support. Um, this ProArt Chroma Tune support, this is a really cool feature um, that we introduced a while back, which actually allows you to set color profiles based on your application. So you could actually open up your web browser and then open up Photoshop and then open up a different program and actually have different color profiles be applied based on the application that's open. So instead of ever physically touching the kind of the on-screen display buttons to make adjustments, it'll just dynamically change. Like maybe you want to be in sRGB mode. Maybe then you want to go into DCI-P3 mode. Maybe then you want to go into Adobe, R or Adobe RGB and you can map that based on the application. It'll automatically make those adjustments for you. Um, USB-C, as I noted, with the 96 watt support, you also are going to get your USB hub with high speed USB 3.2, including a three type A that are also going to be on there. And then in terms of ergonomic adjustment, it's pretty much four way. So you got your tilt, swivel, pivot and height are all baked in on the unit. So you're going to be good to go. So that is going to be the ProArt PA24A CRV. So a uh, nice update. And in this CRV lineup, we already have quite a number of other models. We have 27 inch models and 32 inch models. So we also have a 27 inch 1440p, we have a 27 inch 4K, we have a 32 inch 4K, and then we also have the 34 inch. And then we go even to our higher end series, which would be more of our HDR displays where um, the most high end PA recently launched, of course, and that's gonna be the mini LED with over 2300 zones, uh, display HDR 1600 brightness. So again, ProArt, if you're looking for color accuracy, um, color performance, text clarity, professional grade results, always check out the ProArt series. So that's going to be a great addition right there. Okay. Let um, me see quick questions right there. Uh, any motherboard announcements from Victor? Uh, for this stream, no. I think the other, the remainder announcements that I have, um, I got uh, 
Uh, we have another, we have a Zen screen monitor, um, the ROG Strix XG27 ACS monitor, um, GPUs, we're going to touch on the GRE models that are going to be launching, but no motherboards. Uh, we haven't, I don't think we've recently had any new motherboard announcements in a little bit. I think the last update was probably the BTF based motherboards. Okay. All right. So next year is going to be this guy. This is going to be the Zen screen. I think this guy's pretty cool. And I want to know your guys' thoughts. What do you think about this new monitor that we have? So this is a pretty interesting display. Um, this is going to be the Zen screen MB229CF. And so some of you might remember the MB249, uh, excuse me, the MB24, which was essentially a larger variant of this. And this is a slightly smaller version. So coming out of the pandemic, coming out of excuse me, um, uh, you know, the work from home kind of uh, movement that we saw, we had a lot of people that were asking for a display that they could use. They could easily kind of move from one space to another space because people were taking kind of their monitor, moving it from their office to their island to like their kitchen or different spaces. And so we designed essentially two monitors that were purposely built to be used in easy ways and have kind of improved level of portability, but not be a monitor that you're going to take with you on the go. Just be able to easily move from one location to another location, whether that's in your office or in your home. So this is a 22 inch display, HD resolution, 100 Hertz, which is nice. So higher than standard 60 Hertz with USB PD support, 60 Watts and speakers and an integrated kickstand. Um, so there's also an included C-clamp mount. So when you see this image right here, this is actually how the monitor is designed to work. So imagine it that you could have the C-clamp at your desk. You can easily mount the monitor. It's got an easy uh, disengage and locking base mechanism. So you can lock it in place and then have a traditional fixed secondary monitor. But then if you want to all of a sudden take it off and then use it, um, maybe even hand it to your kid or to a friend or to somebody that's coming over and you want to have a secondary setup so that they can use a display, you can decouple it. It's got an integrated kickstand. You can hold it, you can move it over there, get it up there. It's got speakers, USB-C, you can power the laptop from the AC power, uh, PC adapter, which is powering also the display and then sending over power. So you can see how it adds a nice level of flexibility and functionality. So you'll see here in this little video, right, that we've got is it can give you a different array of configurations in terms of how you can position it. So you, you can go ahead and easily carry it. You can put it on the C-clamp. You can put it into the kickstand mode. You can go ahead and actually uh, hang it on the side of a cubicle. Many of us that have worked in offices that know cubicles, you could actually see how you could easily attach it to a side cubicle wall and you could also be good to go. So all of that option comes integrated within the way that the monitor is packaged and presented. So you have the kickstand, you have the C-clamp, you have all those accessories. It supports portrait and landscape orientation. So either one. And also, as I noted, the speakers are also present. So um, very nice and flexible. I think this is a pretty cool display. We do already have, like I said, the larger version of this one. So if you wanted even a bit bigger version, we have the 24 inch model versus this is a little more compact model. So pretty much just pick the one that you think is going to work for you best and you're going to get to go. So I'd love to see what your guys' thought on whether you like the concept of this. Um, since its release, we've had really good feedback from people regarding this display. And lastly, also, this is a pretty nice value add. Keep in mind, like many of our displays and many of our products, we continue to have a relationship with Adobe. So you here you get three months of uh, Adobe Creative Cloud included within the display. That's pretty expensive if you're also just doing monthly to monthly. Uh, I already have an account, right? And that's over 50, I think it's like $55 a month. You get that. Even if you're currently a subscriber, you can stack on your subscription. So um, if you're utilizing Photoshop, Lightroom, Premiere, Rush, any of those programs, um, and you get an Asus product, we have different products that sometimes as little as one month included and some that go up to three months included. Pretty cool. So don't want to drop that. Uh, excuse me, don't want to leave that out of the conversation there. So... Um, I will go ahead and leave that in the chat there as well. So let me go ahead and drop that one in there. And uh, did I leave the pro art? I don't think I left the pro art display in there. Michael goes, um, when will the 1600 of PSU come down? Um, well, it's, I don't think it would come down similarly in the same price. We're not competing similarly in that same price segment. Um, you know, if you take a look at what we're doing, like our cable quality is going to be much nicer than the cables that you're going to get there. You also have the wattage display. It's two different series of products. Some 
uh, PSUs on the market are going to be kind of sold purely from a kind of um, max wattage kind of performance to price point, right? Uh, for us, as we don't have a large scale uh, power supply portfolio, although it's now become pretty broad, right? Where we have Prime, we have Tough Gaming, we have ROG Strix, and we have our then our Thor series, right? So we have a pretty wide lineup of PSUs. Our goal is really try to add value within those respective segments, whether it's going to be things like the acoustics, whether it's going to be the aesthetics, whether it's going to be the thermal performance. Take for instance, like Thor, Thor units come with generally almost twice the size of a heatsink assembly as other companies. So there is an additional cost to that, right? We're literally putting more material in there to be able to have even better thermal dissipation performance, which not only gives us quieter operation, but can improve actually efficiency performance because we're keeping the item cooler. So um, if you're talking about kind of purely from a price competitive standpoint, you can't lower your pricing when you're actually adding in more um, specialized designs in there, right? That's it's essentially counterintuitive, right? So from that perspective, that's where our positioning, especially when you're talking about something like a tough, excuse me, like an ROG product versus where if we were probably producing like a 1600 watt prime power supply, there we would look to probably be more aggressive relative to the pricing and just look to produce a you know solid stable and reliable product like what we have right now with our prime power supplies which are 750 watt and 850 watt right okay um Uh, thanks, Michael, for your feedback. We already have portable displays that have wireless connectivity and built into them. And again, having even higher resolution and having those other items would even make it more expensive. I think our goal was to offer what the majority of people ask for, which they generally aren't asking for wireless control and they weren't asking for that higher resolution. Again, as an enthusiast yourself, I think somebody that I've seen the things you're interested in, you tend to gravitate towards a higher end position in the market. So it makes sense why you would ask for that. And it doesn't mean it's off the table, right? Um, you know, I think it would be cool to be able to offer something like a 24 inch. But again, you want to think about the dimensions and resolution target. It's not really common to get something like a 1440p at 24 inches, although we just broke that mold with the ProArt series monitor. But you can see that's still going to be a bit more expensive. So when you start to stack in, kind of going with something that's more specialized in niche, you're going to see how you're also going to increase costs because you're doing something that is not more resident uh, within the volume of the market, if that makes sense. You're actually purposely making something to serve a niche. And generally, the niche isn't going to be more cost um, competitive. It's probably going to actually be uh, higher in price because it's something that's specifically being made for a more limited target audience, right? So that's just the balancing act of it comes when you're talking about product design. Um, all right, so let's go into our next product. Uh, next one is going to be another display. I think I talked about this one a little bit before, guys, but I'm going to just re-highlight it as now we're getting ready to push it out. This is probably one of my favorite displays in our whole lineup that I think we're probably going to have for the first half of the year. So this is going to be the ROG Strix um, XG. 27 ACS and I'm really excited about this one at its price point. So this one is going to be coming in at 299. So uh, if anybody's kind of really been looking to finally step up to I think a 1440p monitor so maybe you have a 1080p or maybe you have a 1440p but maybe it's like a much older 1440p from three, four years ago. I mean, my original 1440p monitor, uh, I got it as a, a gift um, for, uh, for, I think, my birthday, um, you know, like over 10 years ago. And it was super exciting to finally be able to get a 1440p display. But that's 1440p. It didn't have any, didn't have this refresh rate, didn't have this pixel response. I gamed and I used that display actually in a dual monitor configuration for years. Um, really great option. But if, again, if you're looking for kind of finally an upgrade, I think this is going to be a really, really good choice, especially also if you want maybe a dual monitor setup very reasonable in terms of the kind of the price to performance to spec. So what do we get here? This is going to be 27 inches, 1440p, 180 hertz. Um, it will be a newer fast IPS panel with the one millisecond grade to grade performance. Keep in mind, that's just a peak measurement of performance. The average actually overall performance is higher than that. Um, also supports our extreme low motion blur technology, which means it has backlight strobing support, but that can also be run with adaptive sync. You will be reducing the panel brightness when you operate in that, but at the expense of getting improved motion clarity. You also get USB-C connectivity, which is going to be rare at this price point. Um, it will give you a moderate charge level of performance, 7.5 watts, but you're also going to get display support. So if you want to be able to connect something like a laptop or a phone or another device, quite nice. Formalized G-Sync compatibility, which is pretty rare at this price point. Um, the display widget center software, which means you can control all of the OSD in Windows. So if you want to adjust your brightness, your contrast, enable shadow boost, you can do that all in Windows. 
You get the tripod socket in the back of the monitor to mount things like a camera, a light, or a microphone. Um, again, all of that for that $299, I think is a very, very reasonable price point. Nice, clean ID design, thin bezels. Plus, it has this cool little holder right here, so you can actually um, slot in your phone if you want to be able to slot in your phone. And again, with that USB-C, you could run one USB-C cable and be able to charge your display there too, or be able to quickly charge your controller, your keyboard, or your mouse because the monitor has that pass-through power support in it. So um, I'm a big fan of that. Um, very good color performance right here in terms of DCI-P3 at 97%, sRGB at 133%. So that means really nice and punchy, saturated kind of coverage. This also will use the new gaming AI feature. So our OSD, which is giving you kinds of different cool options that we've had. This now supports our new, what's called Dynamic Shadow Boost. Dynamic Shadow Boost is pretty cool because what it will do is previously you would enable it and it would sometimes help to improve kind of the visibility in darker spaces, but Dynamic Shadow Boost is actually what it says. It can actually intelligently analyze and only increase the detail in darker sections while in a brighter section not increase that so that that section doesn't get overexposed, which was sometimes a disadvantage of engaging Shadow Boost. So this is a newer version of Shadow Boost all built in. So um, really cool. I think overall, again, a really great balanced offering for its overall price point. So I would definitely check this guy out if you're looking to upgrade to a 1440p based display. Very reasonable in terms of its price point. You also have full ergonomic adjustment support. Again, pretty rare. A lot of the lower price monitors, sometimes you might only have maybe tilt or maybe some level of height adjustment, but you don't usually get four-way adjustment option. And again, here you can also see the Display Widget Center software in Windows where you can customize everything. You don't have to physically use any buttons to make any adjustments, okay? Um, last but not least, I'll also note that the brightness is gonna be a little bit higher than standard. So technically it says HDR peak 400. I'm not gonna talk about this from an HDR capacity, but more from a standardized brightness perspective. Um, for most of scenarios, older monitors are usually around like 200 to 250 nits. So this will also be a bit brighter than a standard base display, which just helps to give you a punchier, kind of more dynamic image when you're uh, looking at the screen, uh, looking at the display. So all the way around, I think this is a really great addition that we're going to be having here with the XG27 ACS. And I will give you a little bit of a teaser. We will have an, uh, another model, the UCS which if you're looking kind of for like a really good value prop for 4K, then we will have a version of this kind of new XG series monitor in a 4K variant. So again, if you kind of want a new good sweet spot level for a 4K display without getting super expensive, really solid set of specs, then we will have an update coming in the not too distant future for that 4K based variable, 4, 4K based offering, okay? Um, let me go ahead and see here. Um, PD, is, is, is there a reason why you can't take mock coatings off? Yeah, because it's not intended to take off. When you talk about wanting to do the lamination process in the polarizer, it's not just a pure coating, right? Um, it's actually a pretty complex process to make sure that you're putting something in there that is designed to be um, essentially accounted for in terms of the perception of the lighting from the back panel to how the user looks through the display. So there's a lamination process which is really important and so generally it's not something that's designed to be removed because it's looked at as being implemented holistically, right? If you probably try to make it in a way that you could remove it, you would probably also be introducing much more variability in panel to panel consistency which wouldn't be favorable to the user. You could maybe see some be more variable or maybe not have as good adhesion performance or other factors like that. So no, it's, it's not designed from that intent, right? Um, again, I think we are looking at other options as we move forward for people that, for whatever reason, they don't like uh, AR base. But the reality is while that has, I think, been an increase and in where you're seeing some people be more vocal about it, the reality is AR based type of coatings have been the industry standard for more than 20 years in monitors. And I think the reason why is because they've been proven to show that they work really, really well people can have outstanding experiences with them and they tend to also be much more flexible for the wider range of cases, right? A essentially display that is not designed to handle reflections really well is not advantageous to the majority of users because if all of a sudden you have overhead lighting, if you have a window to the left of you, you can't control, if you have other scenarios that come in, all of a sudden you have to be in a scenario where you're countering those type of factors. And some users say, hey, I already count for that, great for you, but the reality is that puts you in the minority 
versus the majority of users that they might not want to always be accounting for that. Or like I said, there's just more varied type of configurations. Um, but we are looking again at alternatives in the future. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and see. <laughs> does the Omni figure come with the display? No, it doesn't come with the display. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Cargos is the pro art line of motherboards strictly for creators or it can be used for gaming and overclocking like X570 boards. Um, I see YouTubers saying pro art is not for gaming. Um, I don't know why any YouTuber would, would say that. Um, but no, the reality is that there's no fundamental um, technical reason why you can't use any one of the series for any purpose. Can you use a prime motherboard for gaming and for content creation? Can you use tough gaming for content creation and for gaming? Can you use ROG? or ROG Strix inversely, same thing pro art. Yes, there will be sometimes certain features, functions, or aesthetics that are more complementary to one user base than another. So an example would be like on a pro art motherboard, it might have like a specialized dual slot slicing design. So that's really complementary because if you talk about like a GPU that's like 2.5 slots, you can put two of those graphics cards on a pro art motherboard. Now that really benefits a creator, somebody that's using like DaVinci Resolve or 3D Studio Max or Blender, um, things along those lines. It doesn't benefit a gamer because gamers can't use dual GPUs anymore. So there's no benefit to them, right? Um, or things like 10G networking. There are enthusiasts that like it, but really from a gaming standpoint, there's not a real clear advantage to having 10G. But is, can a creator benefit from it? Yeah, because if I'm doing you know, uh, HDR video, uncompressed video, high resolution photography, and I'm transferring files to like my 10G NAS, that's a benefit. So we try to design the product more so to complement user base, but can you use a, a pro art motherboard for gaming? 100% and we actually have builders that love it because it has great features, it looks really clean and minimal, and they like the set of specs on there. Um, and I think actually from some of the value prop, some of the pro art boards are really, really great. Like if you want 10G or even sometimes other features, it's cheaper to go with a pro art motherboard than it might be with one of our ROG motherboards. So I tell some people, some people like, actually, yeah, maybe check out that B550 creator or check out that pro art X670 versus this other board where I think it might actually hit you better in terms of your budget. So you can totally use a pro art motherboard for gaming. Okay. All right. Um, so to totally. Yeah. So uh, tech 505 is, you can game on a pro art same as tough gaming or rog but may cost more money right for features you don't need um and that's why i like i said i initially recommended when i was showing you like hey would i rather recommend that you probably get like that tough gaming plus or that rog strix a yes because most of our pro art motherboards are going to be positioned usually higher than our mid-range because we're trying to give more features that are generally more for a prosumer or for professional so tech 505 makes that good point as well there is it can you use it? Yes. And if you really like the aesthetic and the spec and the budget works well for you, 100% you can go for it. You don't ever feel like, oh, I'm going to get more limited anything. Even from like overclocking, the, the pro art boards are just as good in terms of being able to give you a very good OC experience if you do want to do overclocking. In fact, like the Intel boards, they come with AIOC, which is the same great feature that uh, we offer on the ROG motherboards. But yeah, you might be paying more for something that you might not use. Like I said, could be paying, you're paying for Thunderbolt, you could be paying for 10G and you don't use that. So again, you just have to balance out what it is you're looking for, right? And if you really want guidance on that, we have a really great live stream where I've gone through, and I think very few places have this type of resource where I have like a full motherboard live stream. It is long, but if you just kind of want to put it in the background and listen to it, I cover and kind of compare all the models in the lineup. So you can really kind of go like, oh, that sounds good to me. I like the fact that that one had four M.2 slots versus that one only had two, or this one has this many USB ports and this one has that. And I explain the differences between the different series. So, so we have that for both AMD models and we have that for both Intel models, okay? All right, so uh, let's go into our next product here. Um, that was the XGS. So let's round things out guys here with the GPU update. So this is gonna be um, for the latest GPU, of course, from AMD. Um, of course, ASUS is a AMD partner. Um, and so we are happy to be able to support, of course, AMD with their latest GPU with the Radeon RX 7900 GRE. So this is going to be an update in relation to the 7900 series coming at a little bit more aggressive price point. So you're seeing essentially your GPU um, between the two models that we have. We have a dual model that is 570 and then we have a tough gaming model, which is 600. So 
Uh, if you're kind of looking for kind of comparative performance, you're probably looking at something like the 4070 Super um, in terms of that price, which we also offer that as we are a partner that supports both NVIDIA and AMDB solutions. So it really kind of comes down a little bit to maybe certain games, maybe you have a certain preference in terms of the, the driver portfolio or the feature set. Um, this is really gonna be a GPU that I think is gonna do pretty well at almost any type of use case scenario. So if you wanna have a very high performing 1080p card, great choice. If you have like a 1080p monitor where you're focusing at like 1440p, excuse me, 1080p, 165 hertz, 240 hertz, 280 hertz, good choice. If you want a 1440p monitor like at 144, 165, 180 hertz, good choice. If you want an entry level 4K gaming, card also still going to be a solid choice. So this actually can work for quite a number of different uh, segments. Okay. Oh, you know what? That reminds me, I did forget. I thought well, there was one display that I didn't talk about. Sorry guys. So let me go ahead and back up right here. I got one that I did forget to talk about. This is going to be the tough gaming VG169. Um, so this is going to be the Tough Gaming VG259Q3A. Uh, this is going to be a great choice for those that are going to be on a more limited budget. Maybe you're just looking for a first time build option that you want to be able to get into PC gaming and you want a nice solid monitor, esports focused, you know, things like, you know, League of Legends, Apex, MOBA titles, or even just a wide number of games where 1080p is the easiest resolution to drive. Still is great, sharp and clear. Good choice. This is a really solid option without being very expensive, but getting a new modern up-to-date performance monitor design. So uh, if we take a look at the specs here, this is gonna be a 24.5 inch display, 1920 by 1080, 180 Hertz, new modern fast IPS based panel, uh, supports our backlight strobing technology, that one millisecond gray to gray. Again, that's a peak measurement. The overall average response time will be higher. It does have FreeSync based support, so VRR support, and it has variable overdrive. Variable overdrive is pretty rare to see within this price segment. If you're not familiar with variable overdrive, this just helps to mean that there's technology that helps to manage the, um, the tuning of the monitor across the refresh rate range. Because of course, when you're playing a game, you can't necessarily always guarantee that your game output, your FPS is gonna be at 180 frames a second, right? Um, so if you're gonna have a variable refresh rate, you actually want your monitor to hopefully have a variable overdrive technology, which means it's trying to make an adjustment to keep the motion clarity performance consistent, whether you're gonna be at like 120, 140, 160, or 180. Um, and traditionally, this has only been seen on much higher end monitors. And so we've been bringing it to more and more monitors at lower and lower prices. So very cool to be able to see variable overdrive at a monitor that's only $170 and even essentially almost 100% sRGB, 99% sRGB coverage, really nice. And even basic speakers, they're not amazing, but they're just gonna be solid there for just giving you some basic playback audio. If you're maybe test posting a system, maybe listening to a stream or a podcast or something like that, they could be a nice little pinch to kind of work for you right there. Um, so again, a nice addition at 170 bucks it's, you know, it's a, I think it's just a very solid value, right? If you're just looking for a nice performance based display, especially I think for sometimes like a first time build type of scenario where you don't have a lot of money, this is a very reasonable monitor to go with from that perspective, okay? So just one that I wanted to drop in there, right? Okay, so um, let's go back then to the GRE as we talked about, um, so, Radeon RX 7900 GRE, we're gonna have a couple of models. So let me go ahead and put the two models in here. Uh, the first model is going to be the Tough Gaming. And then we're gonna have the Dual model. So let me bring those two up right here. Um, let's go, I guess, first with the Dual. So uh, for most of you that are not aware, generally the Dual is gonna be the cheaper of the course the two. That's our more compact based card design. So that's gonna be like what you see right here. Generally gonna usually be like a 2.5 slot card, compact, works really well in terms of its overall cooling performance. It's gonna be cool, it's gonna be quiet. Um, works great for ATX, micro ATX, mini ITX based builds. Um, so I'm a big fan of the Dual based models. If you're looking to have a little bit more kind of cooling headroom, you want even a bit quieter operation. Um, AMD is also working on a forthcoming tuning update to further maximize overclocking margin that will be enabled right there. Um, if you want more of that headroom, then of course, the I think the tough gaming option will be a more favorable choice in that respect because you're just getting a little bit more cooling, but it's still definitely also possible on the, on the dual model. So let me go ahead and bring up here. 
um, and we'll show you right here the dual. Give me one second and we'll bring this one up here. So this is going to be the 7900 GRE um, dual. Again, nice, compact, clean card um, that's going to work for you there, there. They went with a little bit of a more shadowy kind of B-roll shot right there. It looks pretty cool. You do get the newer, actually, uh, axial take base fans with the ring uh, with the ring barrier design. The ring barrier design means that on the inside, excuse me, on the uh, on the external portion of the fan blade housing, right, it actually has a ring, and that helps to actually focus static pressure into the heatsink and the fan assembly, which you can see heatsink and fan assembly right there. You have two, of course, eight pin PCI Express power connectors right there. So very easy to be able to power. It's not a huge amount of power. I will say though, the 4070 is going to be a more power efficient based card. So if you have a more lower wattage power supply or you really care about power consumption, the 4070 Super will be superior, um, but it'll pretty much look equivalent. The dual models and the 4070 Super will be pretty much looking the same as far as they're using a very similar uh, thermal design. Um, the 4070 though also will run a bit cooler in terms of the overall temperatures for the card as well. Okay, um, so let's lastly go ahead and bring this guy up here and uh, we'll kind of close that out. So here's just a little bit of shot. No RGB lighting on this card. Um, really again, yeah, nice, just cool, compact, quiet option. And again, I talked already about the performance target that we have available for this model. And again, as you saw, I noted 2.5 slots, a little bit less than that. 2.47 but effectively it's the same right about a 2.5 slot card and all of the cards that we have of course they are produced using the asus auto extreme production process which means that we use an advanced smt uh, surface mount technology process to be able to mount all the components and then we go through advanced laser inspection what's called aio advanced optical inspection analysis to actually check the cards and whatnot so that everything is working the way it's intended um, doesn't matter which card actually in our lineup, they're all built to that same degree. So it doesn't matter whether you buy a $200 card or a $1,000 card or a $3,000 card, they're all going to be built using the same exact standard in that respect. Um, let me go ahead and bring up the, uh, do I have it here for this one? Yes, I do have it for, do I have the tough gaming? I thought I had the tough gaming. Give me one second. Oh, there it is. Okay. And uh, the Tough Gaming goes um, up from 570 to 600. So you're going to be talking about essentially a $30 Delta. And here you can see, uh, if you've seen it's pretty much any one of the 40 series cards, it looks very similar. It has that really nice, clean, minimal ID design. Um, you will step up to get a little bit, of course, of lighting uh, based design on there. And you will even get better cooling performance on this model. You'll see that you have those two zones of lighting. Whether you have the card vertical or horizontal, you will be able to see the RGB lighting implementation. So it doesn't matter, again, vertical or horizontal. This will be a little bit larger, but still compact. It'll be under the three slot, but it will be larger than the 2.5 slot. So still, it'll fit in a wide range of chassis, especially for ATX based builds. It'll still be a great choice in that respective. Uh, I believe I can give you the temperature target information. Give me one second and I can bring this up. I think I actually have uh, the temperature information here. Mm. Uh, I thought I had it. Give me one sec. Now keep in mind that for the temperature information that I will communicate, um, Generally, when you're talking about temperatures, keep in mind that we're kind of reporting, I'd say a worst case uh, scenario. We're looking at things usually where we have a hotter ambient temperature environment as we increase that. Um, also maybe a little bit more restrictive in terms of um, airflow configuration. And also I would say that we usually use more of a heat soak. So we might be using something like a more of a power virus type utility. So something like, let's say like Firmark, or we can also use what's called a, um, uh, we can use a, a thermal plate, and so the plate will actually heat up and it will do a directly make in contact with the base of the, um, the cooling solution, and that's actually what will be used to kind of provide a certain level of heat 
that we will test for dissipation, whether it's like 200 watts, 250 watts, 300 watts, whatever it might be. Um, in most situations, your real temperature performance will actually be less. You'll, you'll notice, uh, well, excuse me, your operating temperature will be less than what I'm going to communicate. Um, and that's just because games won't produce the same type of generally temperature target. So overall approximation, um, if you're operating in P mode, so P mode is the performance mode, that's the default. Uh, here, this is going to be running essentially a 3D mark at a 25 C ambient temperature would be 50, 56 degrees. Uh, I think that's very reasonable in terms of a temperature performance. And then even in the Q mode, so if you put into the quietest mode, which won't affect the power performance, it just actually brings down the fan curve, that would be 62.5 degrees. So 56 or 62.5. So in either scenario, they're both going to be very cool in terms of the overall temperature performance. Um, in terms of the dB measurement, uh, what we've done for my temp te temperature testing performance and then measuring the, uh, the acoustics and the audible output for the card, P mode, you would be looking at 45 dB, uh, excuse me, 42 dB. And then in Q mode, you would be looking at 35. At 35, I mean, 42 is already very good. Um, 35, 35 is going to almost be inaudible. It's pretty much just about silent. So um, yeah, very quiet card, very cool card. So again, if that's where your priority is, then consider the tough gaming based variant. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so let me go ahead and quickly see any quick questions that kind of came up right there. Um, Michael goes, what does GRE stand for? Uh, GRE, it's actually, this model was originally produced for the APAC region. So for the China region, but now AMD has gone ahead and brought it in. So GRE is a great, I think it's a great rabbit edition. Um, and so it was the year of the rabbit. So that's kind of what it was attached to. Um, but right now if we're in the American market, we're just noting it as the GRE based model. Okay. Uh, Eva goes, what's the MSRP of the 4090? Um, well, you can always check. If you always want to check MSRP, just look at the, I mean, generally all of our channel partners usually follow MSRP pricing, but you can also just check the Asus eStore. Uh, the Asus store is our official store. So that will actually always give you your pricing information. Um, let's see if I, if I bring up my price, uh, can actually bring it up right here. So... Uh, you didn't say which model. It, oh, so you said 4090 Strix, right? Yep. So, give me one second here. And I can show you how, if you ever want to check that, if you're not sure on how to look through that, you can go here. So let me bring up the link to our store. Okay. So if you want to see right here, you can always just go to our shop and then you can just put in the model and you'll see the pricing listed. So you can see here are Tough Gaming. Uh, standard Tough Gaming pricing is uh, $1,600, so $1,599.99. You can see then the OC model is at $1,819, right? And then here on the ROG Strix, uh, the base non-OC model, there's of course uh, an OC and a non-OC base model, right? But you got $1,950. And then you have here should be the OC model you can see is 2000. So um, you can always check the pricing if you want to check it there. If there's ever any price adjustments, they would first be re probably reflected there. But um, Amazon, Newegg, B&H, Micro Center, they're all channel partners. So generally they're going to be an adherent to that. I always tell you though, if you're buying a card, be mindful of wanting to buy first party versus third party. So Amazon and Newegg both do have third party marketplaces. So you can find a listing on Amazon, but it could be sold by a third party third parties don't necessarily adhere to MSRP pricing because they're buying and they're in essentially kind of reselling the product. So uh, if you want to try to be purchasing at MSRP pricing, you should be buying from a first party. Okay. So Evo, yeah, sorry, I can't comment in uh, for Europe. Uh, Europe, um, you know, the pricing and availability is going to be different. Um, so my recommendation would be if you want to check on what the MSRP pricing is in your region, um, you can just reach out to the ASUS uh, point of contact in your region. So if you go to the website for whatever country you're in, so I don't know, you're saying EU, but that's the European Union, right? So it could be a number of different countries. Just go to that respective site. So let's say, I don't know, it was France. You go to ASUS France, go to contact us, and you can reach out to them and you could ask them, one, what are the confirmed channel partners? So they might tell you, 
uh, I don't know what they are for France, but for like UK take, for instance, like I think like Scan is like a is a is a partner, right? So they would tell you, hey, this e-tailer, this e-tailer, this e-tailer, and generally the same thing. Channel partners will be in adherence to whatever the MSRP pricing is for that region. Will it be the same as our pricing? No, because different laws and different factors come into play regarding uh, pricing. So there could be tariffs, there could be you know shipping, there could be any number of different kind of factors that come in relative to pricing, even quantity and demand, right? Some people sometimes want one product, but that product might not be as maybe prevalent or as popular in one region. So to bring it in will be more of a factor, right? So that's just something to be mindful of. Okay. All right. So that care that covers pretty much all of our new products that we have. So we're going to get ready to go in the PCDIY Builder Spotlight, guys. But I did want to go ahead and ask, I maybe should ask this a little bit earlier uh, when we had, I think, the most people joining us here for the stream. But for the people that are still joining us, I wanted to get your guys' feedback. We are right now in discussion to potentially bring in one of our um, IP collaborations that we currently have right now limited to the APAC in the China region. Um, this product is actually what we call our TX gaming product, and we have not released this in the US, um, but there is some discussion as to whether or not we may actually bring this in this region. So let me go ahead and see if I can bring up a couple of images right here and see what anybody's thoughts might be on whether or not you would be interested in seeing this product. Okay, so give me one second here uh, to bring up uh, some images that I have. Um, so let me see here. bring this up we got the power supply all right and all right Okay, so sorry, I just wanted to bring this up here. Okay, so here you guys go. So uh, this is one of the first ones. So this is an example of the TX Gaming product. Um, you'll see that it's got a little bit more of a distinctive stylized ID design. Um, it's gonna be a bit on the brighter and kind of wider side. So you'll see some pretty much kind of accents of a soft kind of white, a little bit of kind of a softer gray that's present in there. And then the kind of this teal blue. Um, I really do like the color combination. I think it looks quite nice. In terms of the ID design, here's an example of the graphics card. We actually had produce this tentatively for both a BTF and a non-BTF based solution. Uh, this, I believe, GPU was in the 4060 and the 4070 based segmentation of the market. Um, again, you can see right here the overall ID design, uh, but we do have some other items within this. So if we bring up some other kind of products that you can see within the TX, game, TX Gaming lineup, we can show you right here. Here would be an example of the AIO cooler uh, under the TX Gaming right line so again you can see the white you can see this cool kind of little axe pattern right there with the black i think it's pretty cool pretty interesting in terms of the design uh the power supply now sometimes in a system you might have a more kind of um isolated view of the psu so you might not even see it um here this is kind of modeled off of our tough gaming so we already have an upcoming tough gaming model in white it has white cables as well so i don't know if you'd want that to be clear though this model will actually come with a white and matching kind of teal cable that looks really, really nice. So again, if you're kind of into that entire color scheme, you would be able to see that within the power supply. The cables would actually be that white and that teal based uh, matching cable design along, even if you didn't see the power supply, but you wanted that nice, bright, kind of cool color combination that's soft and cool, then you would see that within the PSU. Um, and then lastly, let me see here, if we bring up, I think on the motherboard side, um, see if I can bring up here an example of one of the boards. So, Let me go ahead and bring this up here. Give me one second. And let's see what some of the feedback is there. Uh, so PGPC says, oh, you know, I'm going to want this. Okay. 
Michael Braun says, actually, he says, it looks nice. Um, and then uh, Evo7 says, this will sell. So you, I think, so it sounds like we have some people that would be, I guess, interested in, in seeing this TX Gaming uh, lineup. I, I had previously posted this in the, in, in the PCDIY group, I think when we originally announced the White Series PSU. So it's not something that's 100% different or new, but um, again, we just kind of want to see some of the feedback. So I'm going to actually bring up our APEC region store and we can actually show you again some, some kind of closer images. So if, again, we take a look at the motherboard, you can see, again, you have that similar type of look and feel where you've got the silver and you've got a little bit of that, that kind of soft blue. The blue is also kind of cool. You can see it's carried in on the PCB design. So I think that's pretty interesting right there. Um, here you can also see it in actually in a full system. Uh, this is actually the white Tough Gaming GTO2, but this is the BTF base variant. So we actually have also the matching kind of motherboard in it with there. And then that was with the 47, 4070 series GPU, right? Um, again, here's the motherboard and the GPU design. Uh, here's another alternate version of the TX Gaming as well. So again, you'll see it's in that white, but with that usually that teal aesthetic. So we do have that in combination, like I said, for the motherboard. Um, is actually also peripherals. I believe there's a keyboard and a mouse and a matching headset, but it would be, I think initially looking to say, hey, motherboard, probably graphics card. And I think the AIO cooler, I think those three are probably the most. I think the power supply would be kind of cool because I think the cables do look really nice and they match pretty well. So um, just again, what would your guys' thoughts be? So I think overall here, it sounds like we got some pretty good feedback here. So um, PGPCs uh, proceeds to start looking up parts to try and get my hands on it. Michael notes, Yes, um, could be BTF only, right? And that's where I noted again, we do have BTF and we have non-BTF. So it just depends on whether or not there would be kind of interest within that respective, right? Um, um, so Tech505 says, because it will feel, because it's different, it will feel like something new and be good for sales. Yeah, I think um, people would be always interested. Again, we could kind of look at this almost like an IP collab, like we've done with Evangelion or we did with Demon Slayer, or we've done with, you know, Call of Duty, our other IP collabs. So I um, TX Gaming has run for a longer period of time, so it hasn't necessarily been more limited um, in the same way that Evangelion. So it could be something that we actually have for a longer period compared to some of those other more limited IP collaborations. But it is something that we're just kind of right now collecting feedback on and whether or not we would see interest in that. So it sounds like you guys don't think this would be a bad option. So thank you guys for your feedback. We'll definitely pass this over and we'll probably have a bigger community poll in the PCDIY group to get your guys' feedback um, on whether or not you would like to see this. And I guess of which products, which one would you like to see? Would you rather see maybe the micro ATX, the, the ATX based offering. I'd really love to see the micro ATX TX gaming board because right now we don't really have a higher end micro ATX offering. And with our new A21 chassis and our AP201, I think it would be really cool to pair those two together. But of course, ATX is where the volume's at. So it would make sense to probably also have the ATX based version available too. All right. So um, let's go into the PC Diary World Builder Spotlight. Uh, Tech 505 also gives us. A commentary going as a builder i'm always looking to build something different so i think this would perform right um and pgpc is also gives that feedback is because i would be excited for the micro atx system okay well thank you guys i appreciate that feedback thank you so much for just letting me know what your guys's thoughts are so let's go ahead and take a look at our pc diy builder spotlight for this week let's see who we've got in um i'm hopefully going to be in the next week maybe next two weeks i'll probably finally clear them all out in terms of finally um getting us all done in terms of all of our builds. So uh, we'll hopefully be able to get them all out of the way, but let's go with our first one. So this is gonna be from uh, Alexander Proust or Alex Proust, a fantastic builder and a great longtime member of our ACPC, uh, ACS PC DIY community. So let's go ahead and take a look what he's got with uh, under his banner of Apex Builds. And we've got the Black Series, Black Series. Okay, so interesting. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what we've got here for this. So this is our ASUS PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Again, if you guys have not submitted or this is new to you for the first time, if you're interested, all you gotta do is be part of our ASUS PC DIY community, look at our submission form, which is a featured post, submit your build, whether it's a new build, old build, ATX, micro ATX, mini ATX, air cooled or water cooled, it doesn't matter. As long as it got that ASUS hardware in there, we'd love to be able to show it off here in the stream. So feel free to go ahead and submit your build, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look here. What's the first image that we got? Oh, he, he, he gave us these 
there's some close-up images here. All right, so uh, right off the bat, um, this is looking like we've got a mini ITX-based motherboard. So this looks like a Dash I series. Um, I love the Heat Killer choice. Heat Killer is one of my favorite. I do use Heat Killer in some of my personal builds. Uh, as of late, most of my builds have generally been Optimus and Heat Killer, although I do have still one primary system, which is also um, Bits Power. Uh, really big fan of a lot of the hardware mix that Bits Power has in terms of kind of great choice. Um, very good price, but I love the the really refined kind of almost industrial look that um, Heat Killer as well as um, Optimus bring to the table. Love this already kind of look and feel right here in terms of the curve for the actual runs that we have in there at just a little bit more organic play. So as we pull back, oh, this is starting to look pretty interesting. I'm really digging. Of course, you can see a massive big looks to be an external rad, which makes sense. We can see some tubing right here. So we can see that we're following kind of this newer trend that we've seen over the last couple of years of having a high performance mini ITX based build and then looking to maximize all of the thermal performance externally, right? So going with a really big, large radiator, being able to add tons of fans in there, giving you all that big mount, massive level of thermal dissipation and displacement to be able to cool off all that hardware that you pack into a much smaller enclosure. The cool thing too about that external mechanism is of course it's easy to decouple. You can usually use something like quick disconnects and you could just attach your system and be good to go. Um, Tech Bobo 5, who's actually here in the stream, has done a fantastic build. I think it was called The Recycler. He did some really kind of crazy stuff that was customization. If you guys want to check that out, check out our prior stream where we featured that or join our PCDIY group and check that out or check out his socials and you can see that amazing build that he did that uh, kind of mirrored something like this. So loving the also the kind of the red, black and white. I love just these little details. He's added in this little nice accent logo. Looks like almost kind of like a carbon fiber kind of printing here, which is kind of pretty cool and interesting. The block looks really cool. Um, as you guys know, I'm not always the biggest fan of kind of like a more vertical oriented block, but I think the way that this is laid out, it looks really interesting to see, of course, your block here, block here, and then your tubing all kind of surrounding this. And then of course that big external rad, um, really digging that. And then we shift it up in terms of the color scheme. Uh, although I'm a sucker for the red and the black, I love this. I think I dig this one even a little bit more. I like this maybe kind of fuchsia. So the purples with the blues in there playing around, I think this is pretty slick. I'm really digging this overall kind of look and feel that we have here. So, um, as we now pull back and we take a look at the system without any RGB lighting and actually really seeing what we have going on, you can see this tight, compact, minimal enclosure that we have in there. You can see actually you've got an RG Loki power supply in there, the RG Strix uh, board that we have in there, your nice custom cables, your, of course, your hardline runs. You can see, of course, your um, external fittings right here along with your quick disconnects. I love these nice little kind of chamfered kind of raised feet that we've got here, which is pretty cool, just subtle, but it just adds a nice level of detailing to it. And again, similar kind of carbon fiber type of print. Uh, I don't know if this is a vinyl or if it's actual like a carbon fiber plate or something like that, but really cool, really clean in terms of the overall look and feel of the system. Um, again, Alex always does a really nice, I think, job, attention to detail, uh, very performant based builds. Um, love the overall kind of look and feel. And here we can see that, that system without any lighting. So just kind of raw and straight up and we can see it looks really nice, even just fully illuminated where we've got the block, the tubing. I love this kind of silhouette where we're wrapping around the top and the bottom. Got your flow monitor right there. Of course, some nice aqua computer. You got that integrated of course pump and res combo that's going on right there. And then again, that carbon fiber with a little of that in there. Um, and then you've got your Noctua fans in there, of course, with your rads. So very, very cool. I mean, this is, it's a sweet build. And then here's that final shot. So that's all packed in together. Um, really nicely done. So Tech gives some love, says his is a clean build. Johnny's also saying very nice build. And PGPC says very clean build. I would agree. Um, I think it's cool, compact, performant, and it looks really refined. So uh, impressive. It's always a challenge in these really small builds. Anybody that's built a very small system always knows that they're <laughs> usually, um, it's both sides of the fence. Building a small system is really difficult and building a big, big, a big system is also difficult because big systems, it's hard to figure out how you balance out filling everything and small systems, it's just the challenge to try to pack in everything, right? Um, and also make it look good. Uh, Tech505 also giving some love saying a very cool build and Michael says, so nice, perfect build. So let's go ahead and um, take a look here at his submission form. Let me put, I think maybe two side-by-side -side images just so we can kind of see this all come together. So what would be, I think two kind of cool ones. I think it would be almost cool to see it in the 
in the kind of the before and the after, right? So let's let's maybe do it this way. Yeah, I think this is too a pretty cool shot. So you can actually see it here. It's, you know, it's all lit up, right? And then here it's, uh, you know, not lit up. Um, and which one do you like? They both look cool. I personally like the actual, the little bit more varied color than this one. Although this one does look really good. It looks really kind of just performant and kind of a little bit aggressive with that red. It's, it's pretty cool. But I do really vibe this color scheme. I'm really liking this one, a little bit of kind of the synth wave. But it's weird because it's got some red in there. It's got a little bit of this kind of orange, kind of the, the blue and then the purples. I'm really digging this color selection that he did there. But they both look great. Which one do you guys, the left or the right? Which one are you favoring? Uh, let me go ahead and bring up his submission form here. So this is going to be from Alex Bruce. Um, hopefully I'm saying that right. You guys can check him out, builds.gg apex builds. Um, so in terms of the builds theme, let's go ahead and see what we have written here. So I wanted to give off a supercar look, AMG GT Black Series. I 100%, now that he tells me that, that 100% makes sense, especially with the carbon fiber and those kind of like those details on the inside of the wrap, I'm totally getting that uh, GT Black Series vibe. But not be too literal about it, right? Because um, he didn't want to necessarily have AMG Mercedes kind of badging on there. So he's kind of paying homage taking some design inspiration, inspiration and kind of baking that in there. And I think that he did that beautifully. I think it came through really, really nice. The external radiator almost looks like what I, you would find in a car, which I would agree. The sleeving on the soft tubing also looks like a fuel line. I definitely would agree with that as well. It, it does, as you start to kind of lay that foundation, you can definitely see where there's inspiration and kind of that homage being paid. The colorway is consistently themed throughout the build and use materials you might find in a supercar, such as carbon fiber, metal, chrome, and even actually genuine Alcantara. Wow, I'm wondering where did you put the Alcantara? Um, Alcantara is a really premium type of fabric. You see it in things in terms of like uh, steering wheels and things along those lines, although it can be used on seating as well, as well as some of the underhood modifications. I also took some inspiration from Tear Horse Customs, Terrifics Builds in this case. Yeah, another fantastic builder who we've actually also featured here in the past on the stream. What are three words you would use to describe your build? Super clean and super performance. I would definitely agree with that. Um, it's called the Black Series in terms of the build. Um, so in terms of the core hardware, we've got a 13900K, an ROG Strix Z790-i gaming motherboard. He's got 7200 megahertz or 7200 MT CL34 DDR5 memory. Of course, perfect for a two DIMM enabled board because you can run those higher clock speeds. He's got a tough gaming 4090 that of course is water cooled in there. Uh, Samsung 982 terabyte, uh, Loki 1000 watt PSU. Uh, chassis is here is the John Plus i100 Pro case. And then uh, for the lighting, he's got the Hantex Halos Lux DRGB frames. I'm a big fan of that because that's uh, a really smart play. And that's the reason why that lighting kind of comes up really cool is he can keep that really great performance and also the more compact diameter, right? The thickness of the Noctua fans in great performance, but you can easily add RGB lighting by just using the frames. So I really love that he did that. Um, those are some of my favorite ways to sometimes add RGB, but still be able to pick really great quality fans without having to move to an RGB fan. So I love that. He then also put Aqua Computer RGB strips and the Faberwork 360 RGB controller. Um, looks like the vast majority of what we have there from the primary water cooling is going to be from water cool. So the water cooler heat pro um, with the heavy back plate. And then he's also got a thermal rate contact frame. So that's for the CPU. GPU is also the heat killer V pro for the tough uh, 4090 RG Strix, tough gaming uh, base cards. Um, radiator is also heat killer. It's the rad S360. And then the water cool, the, of course, the MoRa uh, 420 external reservoir, uh, steel key uni 120. And then the heat killer uh, tube 200 D5. Um, pumps, he's got an EK pump in there. Fittings, there's a mix of fittings from EK bits, power, and coolants. Coolants, it's one of my favorite still vendors. They're not really active in the kind of enthusiast space anymore. They still make stuff, but anybody that got into quick disconnect knows coolants, right? Uh, tubing, bits, power, uh, silver shining brass hard tubing. Looks beautiful. And also some EMK, EK ZMT soft tubing that's also in there. Um, fantastic build. So some of the mods, this is pretty cool. I, I want to just touch on some of the interesting mods in here. So CNC acrylic internal case cover panels wrapped in a carbon fiber vinyl. Um, wow, awesome. Also, he gives credit to Justin Chu for helping to cut some of those pieces. He replaced virtually all the fasteners with countersink screws and chrome finishing washers. Um, I wonder if we can actually see any images of that. 
that's one of my favorite details countersunk screws they look just so premium and they add a nice little accent and it's one of those things you're not going to see it but when you show them off they absolutely look fantastic they take your build to the next level so that's really cool he replaced the nylon fabric pull tab on the dust uh, filter panel with genuine alcantara that's really slick that's really cool so i'm wondering if you can actually see it but i would assume like somewhere if there's like the dust filter you can pull that out that's that's slick in terms of being able to add that uh, poster tack to the pump housing and thermal putting to the gpu too oh that's cool that's a little bit of a pro tip uh, so he actually added thermal putty to the GPU chokes or the inductors to reduce coil wind. That is something you can do if you have enough spacing within your block, your cooling design. Another one that you can actually use is you could use high grade, um, uh, like a thermal epoxy. So epoxy that's designed for, um, for thermal and you can actually put that over an inductor as well and that actually can work to, to mitigate actually coil wind. Um, thicker PCIe, uh, a thicker PCIe riser cable to improve the rigidity of the GPU mount. Um, uh, interesting. And then he also put photography diffusion paper on all the RGB strips to reduce the hot spots to have them be cleaner and softer in terms of the lighting. That's where the details come in. And then that uh, fan cover with the RG letters on the back plate, that's all something he added in. Man, that's <coughs> a huge amount of work. Wow, awesome, man. Really, really cool stuff there. Um, about 6K for the budget. Uh, what was he most proud of is the overall level of quality. None of the mods or de uh, design decisions were practically intricate. Instead, it was a little, li a little of a lot things coming together. And that's where kind of like all those small little details sum up to be you know so much more uh, complete in terms of the overall vision and the execution so i definitely agree with there you have to really look at the sum of all of those things to get the total payoff right and they all help to elevate it in their own way right is there anything you would change about the build a quality automotive paint uh excuse me an automotive grade paint job on the case panels and the exterior radiator have been cool how long did it take to do the system too long uh was the system used for pretty much gaming he loves doing some Baldur's Gate, some Alan Wake, and some Helldivers, and Cyberpunk. Love it. His favorite Asus function or feature coming out from this build is he really likes the RG Strix Hive. Other than looking nice on the desk, it's convenient to have the USB BIOS flashback and flex key. Rebooting to the BIOS is what I have set more for immediate access. I hope this is expanded upon in the future products with features like switching profiles in AC, programmable macro buttons, and even a mini OLED display. That's really great feedback and it is something that we actually are considering. So I'm really happy to know that you're actually enjoying the Hive, man. Um, Alex, you killed it. You did a fantastic job. I think the attention to detail is top notch. All those little details in there. Um, are really, really well executed and another fantastic build to just be able to show um, just the level of craftsmanship, the care, the attention to detail and the commitment to high quality execution. So very, very nicely done. Um, so Tech505 also loves, he goes, love how the pipe bend around the GPU complements that really perfectly. I agree. Eva goes aggressive cooling. Um, this user goes, they like the uh, colors on the left hand side. I would agree the colors on the left hand side look really, really nice. Um, and then Michael goes, a very well thought out build. Well done. So yeah, a thumbs up. Very nicely done. So let's head over into our next build. Okay, we still got a little bit of time here. So let's go into another one that we got. So we're going to go into, uh, let's see actually who we had featured on the thumbnail image. So this is going to be from another pretty long time member of our PCDIY group. This is going to be from Nicholas Brown. Um, here we're going to go to a little bit more, I would say, of an every man's kind of build. These are also, I love them. I, it's always cool showing stuff like we got from some of the best builders and modders in the game. But I love also showing our just normal users and what they put together with kind of normal stuff, right? So let's take a look at, I believe it's uh, Gilgamesh, I think is what he named his system. Is it something? Yeah, Gilgamesh XDXO. Okay, so let's take a look here. Ooh, in a in a Helios. It's been a little while since we've took if you've taken a look at a build with the Helios. So um, he went with the classic black Helios. Still one of my favorite chassis because it doesn't look like a lot of other chassis. And I really liked actually that my uh, what we call our Mayan pattern finish. We no longer use it in any of our current RG designs, but that kind of geometric blocking design I thought was really cool when we did have it implemented. So um, he's gone for a kind of cool color blocking effect, which actually I like. Um, it's always interesting when somebody doesn't have to kind of go with a fixed color scheme um, as far as having everything matching because you can sometimes get nice contrast in color. Sometimes people call this like the Stormtrooper type of build or a Panda build because of the black and white vibe. I believe Nicholas told me that he still wants to potentially paint, um, I guess, the 
this portion of the Thor. So he wants this to be a little bit kind of more white. So you would see white here and then also white down in the PSU section. So he said that that's still something that he's, he wants to see did. Now he did go with a vertical mount. Um, normally I'm a bigger fan of a horizontal mount, especially with this generation card because you have that beautiful RGB light bar and you're almost losing out on that light bar with this car being horizontal. But this car does have the light bar which spills in to give it some diffuse lighting behind these fans. So you'll still see lighting here, lighting here, and lighting here. So I still think overall it comes through. Um, overall, I'm digging this initially. Looks really clean and well executed, so nothing to negate there. I think the only one would be, I don't know if I would have added this rear fan. I think that the rear fan is a little bit heavy, um, and that's just because... You know, usually here you don't want to put a full size fan, uh, but it, it does work. It, it does work. And I think it gives it some continuous kind of contrast coming with the display kind of going from here to here. So I can see it's, it's okay, but let's go ahead and continue the journey. So moving over into the side uh, profile shot, this is pretty cool. Um, I like right here that he added in the actual card. So this is the collector's card that comes with the graphics card. So that's pretty cool. Um, in terms of just kind of taking something that comes in the box and adding that in there for display. Really nice clean cable management that he did in wiring all of his fans and everything all in there. So really nicely done in terms of that perspective. It's very, very clean in terms of the look and feel of the system. Um, just uh, I'll, And all the boost, I'll answer your question, OP, uh, OP Ninja, and um, I'll take a look at your guys' question once I'm finished taking a look here at Ma uh, Nicholas's build right here. Um, LX11 says, I'll have to start submitting again. I love these builds. Yeah, it's always cool to be able to kind of show off people's builds here, right? So now we have it lit up. And here you can see, this is one of the reasons why I did really love the Helios. Is that kind of tempered glass design with that Mayan pattern finish. I think it looks really cool, right? To be able to see that come through here. I think it looks really cool, really distinct. And then he's got that classic bold and bright kind of rainbow kind of lighting color scheme. But I think it does actually really work. Um, I think it's cool here where you can see kind of that infinity kind of diffusion color that we have from those in the Lee fans right there. So you get that kind of light bar effect there up at the top. You then also have that nice light bar on the side. You got, of course, the geometric lighting there on the inside as well. You get the lighting from the DRAM. And then you get that, like I said, that backfill lighting that you have from that RGB strip. Now you're missing, like I said, that really nice, bold, bright strip that you would normally get if it was in that horizontal profile. But I dig it. I think that this works well. I think it looks cool and you get a nice contrast between the two, right? So in here we can see if we go to full blackout and you don't have any lighting. So when he's gaming at night, how that system looks. And it's cool. And this is actually one of the cool benefits you get is that going with white, even though most of this now doesn't seem white, by him picking some of the items that were white, he's going to amplify their brightness a bit, but then the other items that are black are going to keep it a little bit more muted and kind of create a little bit of a black void. And this is kind of cool because he's able to create kind of a little bit of an iridescence that happens by mixing the white and the black. If you went with all white, it would still seem pretty bright um, if you had everything all white. Whereas here, purposely him having like the blackboard, the black chassis, but then going with the uh, white fans and the white GPU, it's helping to elevate some of those items to seem just a little bit more defined and a little bit brighter fill. So it shows you actually the balancing actually works pretty cool. Um, so I actually, I really do like that. Uh, just another shot right there. And then here you can see it from the side profile where again, you almost don't really notice that difference between the white and the black anymore, right? Where now you're going here and you can just see just a little bit of the light bar you're missing it, but you can see that beautiful ARGB light bar kind of running through the top right there. But overall, really cool, really nicely done. And actually, I think even keeping the Ryogen with the black model as opposed to being the Ryogen with the white model, I think it actually works better in this combination right here. So um, Tech505 gives some love. He says, nice, the GPU pops right there. Um, so right there, PGPC says the only possible concerning thing with the GPU would be so close to the glass, but there's a nice gap. Um, yeah, actually, I don't think that there would be any issue in that um, for this card. I'm pretty sure, yes, your temperatures are going to be a little bit higher than they would be as opposed to being a horizontal mount, but he's still okay in there. Uh, plus the thermal solution on here is quite performant, and I think you still get enough intake airflow that I think you're pretty solid right there. Um, so also Evo7 says Landly. Uh, is best in light show, uh, but that's hanging there on the right hand side. It looks cool. Yeah, I think right there is that because this is a little bit more of a dynamic fan, if you only had the lighting just from the, the front, it wouldn't look as strong. But since this kind of seems contiguous and carries over here, I think it does actually work. Uh, it, it does actually work pretty well. 
that's another cool little shot where you actually see the fan spinning with the light kind of spilling in there. So overall, I think that's a pretty cool build. I'm, I'm digging that. Uh, let's go ahead and just put a couple images side by side there and we will go with that. So let's, um, I don't know, let's, I don't know which one we'll go with. Let's do maybe this one and this one. So I guess we can just kind of see how they come together. And maybe this shot here. All right, and let's go ahead and take a look at his submission form. So uh, this is gonna be from Nicholas Brown. And this is actually Nicholas's first build, guys. So let's give him a round of applause. Always cool. Great job. It definitely looks better than my first build from however many decades ago, um, right? But um, very cool. Uh, does the build have a theme? The theme is black and white. I still need to paint the PSU Thor white since ASUS still hasn't made a white Thor. That is correct. We, we don't have a white Thor. We have a white RG Strix or a gold, which will be coming out, but we do not have a white Thor. Although the second generation Thor P2 is kind of silver and it kind of works really well for white builds as well. I'm also looking at painting the Ryogen uh, 362 blockhead. So he actually is considering painting the blockhead white. I think it looks really good right now. I don't think you would actually need to paint it white, but the fact that you can easily remove the blockhead does allow you to do painting, I think, much easier than it would be um, without being able to easily remove it. Um, and he feels that that will balance the white a little bit more. Uh, it would be nice to add in a Ryogen 363 white edition also. So he'd also maybe be considering doing that. Um, but the performance already from the Ryogen 2 is really solid, right? Um, what are the three words you would use to describe your build? This is my dream build minus the 3070 RG6 graphics card. It was supposed to be a 3090 white Strix, but had to buy from a scalper when the cards were overpriced. Um, yeah, can understand that, but you know, still a great system, still very performant, but for sure, yeah, that was a challenge definitely when pricing was a bit higher in the marketplace, right, from everything that was happening. Um, hopefully I can trade in this 3070 and finally try to get uh, the 3090 or maybe, you know, wait it out, try to see if maybe you can get a good deal on maybe, uh, uh, maybe a, a 4080 Strix card, right, in white, right? Then my dream PC would be complete, right? Um, does the build have a name? Yes, uh, Gilgamesh uh, XDXO. Um, in terms of his hard hardware, he's running an 11900KF, a Maximus Extreme, um, excuse me, a Maximus Extreme 12, uh, Z490, then the ROG Strix 3070 White Edition, uh, the Ryogen 362, uh, the Thor 850 watt, and then that's all inside of the ROG Helios chassis. Um, he didn't set a budget and kind of just kind of came together over time as he was putting together everything. What is he most proud of is that the motherboard, this is my favorite motherboard of all time, the Maximus Extreme 12. It is a very cool board, great set of features and functions on there. Is there anything that he would change about the build? Um, I would upgrade to a Ryogen 363 in white. I would also like to upgrade to a white Thor if Asus made one. Um, how long did took him to kind of put all together the, the system, about six months. And what is he used the system for? It's strictly used for gaming. I only play Call of Duty and eventually I'm looking to start streaming uh, this game. So pretty much just uses for that. His favorite ASUS function and feature is he actually likes Armory Crate. It allows him to control all of his system in terms of his RGB lighting and his features and functions. So it's a one-stop shop for his control. Man, thumbs up, man. Congrats and nicely done, right? Um, Pidgey PC is yay for Phil's being featured. Great first build as well. And Tech505 giving some love. Congrats, man. I agree, man. Nice job, Nicholas. Kudos, right? Uh, Michael also giving some love there. Very cool. So let's, let's do, let's go. We got two, let's do two left. Two, two, and then we'll wrap up today's stream. So let me go ahead and, hmm. Um... Let's do let's do a friend of us uh, on this on the stream here, um, Mr. Road PC or Derek Wilson. He's got a cool build right here. So let's go ahead and take a look here at this guy. This is a cool kind of little open frame system. So this is going to be from Rhodes PC, uh, Derek Wilson. Great guy, great builder. Um, if you guys are not following, go ahead and make sure and check him out. Um, I'm always a fan of seeing kind of like what an open, uh, an open build is going to look like. Open builds are always kind of interesting to see when you use an open frame chassis and what you decide to do or what you don't decide to do. All right, so we can see we've got the kind of the classic, of course, P-series chassis from Thermaltake in terms of the open frame. Red, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, always nice to see some color in there. 
Um, I actually like here then you going with the vertical mount because you're tying a little bit of the red accent in there along with the red that you get in terms of the open frame. Uh, pretty slick. Some cool little little additions right here where he's got a little bit of a knife. I got some cool kind of chrome hard tubing that you go in there to add some contrast. I'm a big fan of these TT dims. These these I really actually like the way these dims come in and they create that little kind of triangle point in them. I think that gives an interesting kind of cool design. Got some just nice clean red um, you know cables that are on there. Um, that is one that I think I'm. That's a little bit one that I would have loved to tweak. Is maybe just seeing a little bit of the, the the cable change here to be congruent. But I think he was just using some extensions right here, so going with the standard cables and then run into the extensions right there. But um, still, totally dig the vibe. Looks looks good in that respect. I, I, I'm, di I'm totally digging it. So this is kind of interesting. I wonder how you mounted that on there. Did you just kind of just slide it on there? Now I believe this one also comes with the glass panel. I'd love to know. Whether you guys, would you put the glass panel on or would you not put the glass panel on? I think I actually like the openness of not having anything obstructing the visual, so not having the panel on there. Because I'm like, why have the panel? I would just have the clarity of just nothing being in front of there, right? So it is always interesting sometimes in that perspective to kind of see how it comes out. Um, so um, all the boost goes awesome build, right? I definitely agree. Um, I love the hard lines. Yeah. Um, I also like though that you have a little bit of curvature as opposed to like a system where you're sometimes using like a distro and you have just hard perpendicular lines. I always like seeing a little bit of kind of some organic form. So a little bit of curvature. So I definitely agree. I like this kind of look and feel, right? It's just nice. And all the boost also says, yeah, he likes that open look, right? Um, Evo goes, you like it until it's full of dust. I, I've had actually two open frame systems and I didn't really feel it was a big issue for me, but that does, a, it does depend on your environment, you know, um, kind of the airflow static pressure, even where you are in terms of ventilation and other things like that. So it can be variable, but yes, there's, there's always a lot of challenges when you do consider systems like this. I do love seeing just this nice kind of 360 tail lighting design that we have on there and kind of display how it just kind of pops out there. Um, I also like that it's cool that he purposely went with a split loop. So he only water cooled the CPU, but he left the card unlooped, right? Uh, and no block on it. And I think that's cool. One, to just be able to showcase the card. But I think secondary to that, um, it shows you how you can mix kind of the two different ID designs that, in making them kind of complementary to have something just look and feel different. Where, again, you're already getting really great thermal performance from the GPU, so there's not a reason to block it. While you can get a benefit clearly from uh, over, uh, from excuse me, cooling that CPU, plus it adds a different kind of uh, look and feel to the system as opposed to if you would have blocked both, right? Love also here that little frosted aesthetic in that shot that he showed off right there. Um, it's a cool build. It's nice, clean, compact, simple, but well laid out. Cool color scheme that's a bit different than the norm. Um, I think he threw in a video here. Let me see. Yeah, so I think we got a little bit of a... Uh, a video here in terms of assembly so let's just see what we got right there and bringing it all together right so ah uh, yeah i dig it man i like it man derek you get a thumbs up for me man but you always do a fantastic job i think it looks cool i'm digging it i i really like the fact that you went with the the red variant also i think that the red looks cool i like just seeing that inherent color color pop in there um let's go ahead and take a look here at the submission form so Again, guys, you can follow him, Rhodes PC. Make sure to check him out. He's actually got a website, RhodesPC.ca. Okay. Um, so does the build have a theme? Uh, the person I built for had requested a strong red and black aesthetic with an ROG Strix 4090 being the star of the build. Hence why it makes sense that, of course, you're going with that vertical mount. What are three words you would use to describe the build? Powerful, fun, and dangerous. <laughs> uh, dangerous in terms of giving you too much frames, right? Um so uh, does the build have a name? If so, what's it called? I've been referring it to as the Redcore P3. So not really any name of significance. What should I name it? Does anybody have any thoughts? What would you guys call this build if you d weren't using the name that Derek noted, Redcore P3? Would you have a name? So love to see what your guys' thoughts in there. In terms of the hardware, what we got going in there, we've got an ROG Strix Z790-E gaming motherboard, an Asus ROG Strix RTX 4090, uh, 13900K, uh, Thermaltake Core P3, a thousand watt uh, power supply from TT as well, two Samsung 980 two terabyte PCIe NVMe SSDs. He's then got 64 gigs of um, DDR5 from Thermaltake. Now in that situation, that I don't know what the speed is, but that would probably be the only thing. I think aesthetically, of course, for some people they like it a little bit more because you have that complete contiguous RGB lighting line. But of course. With a 3900K in this board, and he has got a good IMC, you could probably run even higher memory clocks. You could be running like a, maybe like a, 
6,800, 7,000, maybe even 7,200, right? Um, and, you know, you're not going to be running that with a four DIMM configuration, regardless of whether it's single rank or whether it's dual rank. He's going to be running single rack memory if it's only 64 gigabytes. So you might be able to get a little bit more aggressive, but you're definitely not going to be running at the higher frequency range. So that, my personal opinion, I would have gone with only a 2 dim, but I can understand from an aesthetic perspective why you go with the 4 dim config. Um, water cooling is done by a combination of thermal take and EK water cooling components. Um, the budget uh, for the build was about $5,000. Um, what aspect of the build were they most proud of? I really enjoyed the simple loop with the chrome tubing and how powerful the GPU sits. I would agree, I think. Uh, I love that dual contrast and I really like the chrome that it just pops against all the black and definitely also pops against the, the red that you have within the backdrop, right? Is there anything that you would change about the build? I would have liked to change out the tempered glass panel for a custom piece of acrylic if I would have had more time to work on it. That yeah, makes sense, okay. How long did it take them? About two days worth of time. Uh, what's the system used for is gaming, Call of Duty, Forza, and Starfield are the games that the client plays. And then what's his favorite kind of ASUS or function or feature within this is I would have to say the quick release button added to the Z790 motherboards is really helpful. Uh, I also love the quality of that feature. Yeah, I would agree. It's just really easy to be able to click that button, eject the graphics card, be able to remove it, man. Nice thumbs up, man. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Um, so let's just see right here. Any quick feedback? Um, what do you recommend a desktop PC or a laptop PC? I think it all depends. Uh, we of course make both. We make desktop PCs. We have our ROG Strix uh, desktops. And then we also have tons of laptops from Zenbooks to Vivo books to of course ROG Strix to Zephyrus to our pro art studio books. Um, and I think it just comes down to what's your budget, what's your perform, what's your performance target, and what's your use case, right? Um, if you have maybe some more details, because that could get into a deeper type of question, maybe consider posting in our PCDIY group, which is linked in our description below, and giving a little bit of context, and we can see if we can give you maybe some recommendations on really what might be the better choice for you to go with. We focus here on the stream really about the PCDIY narrative, but that doesn't mean that that inherently is going to be the best choice for you. It might make more sense to maybe go with the laptop, right? Um, so I think it just comes down to, again, what is your budget? What's your performance target? What's going to be your use case? And that'll help to start to define more likely what might be the better choice for you, right? Um, so uh, Michael goes, name he would like to say is ROG Ninja Red. Tech goes the Devil's Lair. Ooh, both of those are cool. RG Ninja Red. I think I like Devil's Lair. I think it just sounds a little bit more menacing. Um, this user goes Megatron Marvel uh, is there. Uh, so I think both of those are pretty cool. PGPC says, I was going to say Samurai. So if maybe Samurai Red, Samurai Ninja Red or Samurai, Ed, I think that's kind of cool. Um, Michael goes, like Samurai, like, hey, about Ronin, right? Yes. Uh, so overall, very cool, man. You guys did a great job. Thanks for giving some uh, submissions there as far as for the names. And Derek, man, you did a fantastic job as well. So kudos on the build. So let's go ahead and wrap it out with one last one. And we'll close out the stream, guys. As always, thank you guys for joining the stream. It's been fantastic to be able to go ahead and uh, be able to highlight some great, great, some great builds here on the stream. So let me go ahead and bring up one last build here. I think this one is, ooh, I'm also almost like, do I want to save that for next week? But no, no, no. We just go big or go home. That's the, that's the way it is, right? So let's just go. Um, this one is pretty cool. This is from Sam Co. Um, and let's take a look at this one. This is going to be a mini build. So this is going to be the arc. And this will wrap up today's stream, guys. So let's go ahead and put this one in. Let me bring up his submission form here. All right. Let's take a look here. This one's pretty cool. I mean, it already looks pretty cool. Another kind of open frame system. Um, and we've got a little bit of a mix of everything kind of going on here. So we can see we've got, of course, our pump, our res. I really like, of course, the transparent kind of tubing runs that we have here. Another ROG Strix-I, another Loki that we've got set up in here. Love the frame, right? This is just a cool kind of centerpiece. You make sense why you would want to put this on your desk right there, kind of be able to show it off. It just kind of looks cool, looks different, looks interesting. And this is, I think, one of the interesting things about why there's no wrong or right choice when it comes to picking a build, right? Is it always the same choice to go with a mini ITX build? No. 
And sometimes it's more expensive, it's more complicated, but it allows you to have something that can look and feel different and you can still have pretty close to the same level of performance and feature set as we've seen from the builds here from Sam as well as from Alex, right? And, and many other small form factor builds that we've showcased, right? Um, so it's some interesting things that I see right here. Did he use a different type of SMA connector for the Wi-Fi there? I'm not sure. That looks actually pretty interesting. I like that it looks like uh, this is really nicely managed in where, of course, he's bringing in all the cables over there. So that looks pretty cool. Um, some nice custom cables that he's got, of course, running in there right there. But as we kind of pull back, we can see right here, cool to be able to see the dual scenario. I'd, I'm wondering on which way I would have positioned this. And that's kind of interesting if maybe I would have done it at an axis so I could kind of see both, both sides. I mean, this side does look really cool with just kind of that monolithic clean block, um, you know, that you have there. Fantex makes, I think, some really cool, interesting angular blocks that support our cards. So it's cool to be able to kind of see theirs because they're not necessarily as commonly seen here in the stream. And then, of course, got the Landley fans. I think these look pretty cool as far as in a push and pull config that we've got right here, which is pretty interesting. Again, I think the secondary light accents on the front of the card work well. That nice bright illumination that you have within the center looks also nice. Uh, but I really do dig this white with the with kind of the yellow then this, this kind of gray and silver, and then of course you've got your kind of chrome fittings. I think these are all a really nice synergistic color play that's uh, that's going on right here. Um, but even the pop of color right here by bringing in something kind of almost like a brass or kind of copper, maybe a little bit more of a copper kind of vibe, I think is pretty cool. And again, shows you how you can have something like color blocking where you don't need to match everything. You can purposely have different things that have different colors and you might think, well, it's not the same and it doesn't work but it purposely shows you how you're adding contrast we can make other colors kind of pop, right? Which I think is pretty well done. Um, yeah, I really like the way this side looks too. Actually, even being able to see, normally you wouldn't want to see the inside of the power supply, but it's kind of cool that you get a little bit of the lighting. This also has RGB, so you can kind of see inside there. You see, you know, the capacitors, you see the toroidal dials, you see the fans, you see all that kind of stuff in there. And that, that just kind of looks kind of cool with the board and the memory and all that. So... It's kind of cool, like which side you almost want to look at, right? Like, do you want to look at that side more? Or do you want to look at this side more? Um, but all the way around, it's it's a cool kind of just looking vibe. And it's nicely done in terms of managing, you know, all the cables. It's a challenge in itself because this is an open frame system. There's not a lot of places to really hide everything. So you're going to see some stuff kind of coming out a little bit, but that's kind of the beauty of a little bit of its more dynamic form, right? Where it's just a little bit more kind of spread out. Um, pretty cool right there. Um, also cool, just integrating right there your flow monitor and your temperature monitor for your loop and then bringing it all together with the system. That's a cool vibe, man. It's got a cool look. It's got a cool feel. It's pretty nicely done. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, see what we got right here. So um, Pidgey PC says, uh, that's awesome looking. I agree. I think it looks really cool, right? Um, uh, Chernobyl looking at the wide open white makes me thinking nuclear, right? Uh, perhaps even Arctic cold, cool looking, right? Um, yeah, so OP Ninja, man, uh, no problems. Yeah, thank you for picking up the UCDM. Uh, feel free to go ahead and ask a couple of questions. I don't know um, if I can, let me see if I can, I'll cover, I'll make sure to look at your question before we wrap up the stream. So no worry, I will make sure to take a look at it right there. Um, Get some love right there in terms of saying that the build looks pretty cool. This guy lives in a spaceship, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. So let's go ahead and um, take, oh, sorry. Let me go ahead and bring up his submission form here. Um, so this is going to be from Samco. Um, not his first build. Uh, what was the theme? It was a compact fusion reactor. So I think some people saying nuclear and stuff like that, it makes sense. Three words used to describe the build is futuristic, powerful, and compact. Does the build have a name? The Ark. Um, so he did actually give us a submission form link. So I'm going to see if I can maybe click on that. Uh, it's not actively letting me click on it. So, uh, one second there, um, budget for the build was $4,700. What aspect was he most proud of is that tastefully RGB bestoke down to the cabling one of one and truly mine. Yes, I would definitely agree. You're not going to look at the system and confuse it for somebody else's system. It definitely feels like a unique kind of one-off system and it has a, a lighting scheme, a layout choice, and just the, the selection and overall presentation inherently feels to whatever that person wanted. And that's the beauty of PC DIY, right? Is there anything you would change about the build? Adding an infinite valley RGB component in progress to add gold to the front and match the infinite look of the fans in the black. 
that's pretty cool. I think that would be pretty interesting. And he says that's in progress. So I'd love to see the updated visual here and we can refeature that. Um, how long did it take him to put together, build essentially the system? Six months, six months off and on. He lost about 12, uh, excuse me, about one to two months waiting for parts. Yeah, I think everybody knows the pain of sometimes waiting for parts, right? Uh, what is used the system for? It's all about gaming. He likes to play Diablo 4 in Guild Wars. And then his favorite Asus function and feature is a generous number of USB ports on the motherboard. I would agree. Um, it's definitely one of the big reasons why people tend to buy our higher end motherboards, man. But overall, very nicely done. Uh, very sweet. Um, pretty cool. Thank you for submitting right here. So um, uh, let me go ahead and see if I can quickly bring up his submission form. Excuse me. Um, if I can bring it up on uh, his, his other post that he had there. Because I want to see if we've got, um, I couldn't bring up the active link. The link for some reason wasn't working, so I couldn't bring it up. Um, so uh, I'm not able to bring up that full parts list. I'd love to be able to breed out the full parts list, but for some reason the link is not working there. So I can't bring it up. But overall, it's really, really nicely done. Uh, looks great. So overall, man, fantastic, man. Thanks for submitting. Um, clean, well, nice and nicely executed. And I do definitely agree. I think your theme on point, and I'd really love to see that kind of complementary uh, RGB element that you're talking about to tie in the rear into the front, I think look, would look pretty sweet. Um, let me go ahead and take a look at what that last question was there from OP Ninja. So OP Ninja was asking, will there be a KVM auto switch feature that would be implemented in the future for I currently need to manually switch KVM devices in the OSD? No, um, I don't believe that actually we can add that in through firmware. So this is actually a different type of KVM design that is utilized on some of our other devices. So when you actually see the KVM functionality, um, it will note either KVM or smart KVM. So take for instance, like the PG34 WCDM that has a smart KVM and the smart KVM also has more advanced functions in terms of using file to file transfer um, and intelligence between the two excuse me, connected devices and even including like um, keyboard hotkey mapping. So you can press like hotkey mapping to be able to toggle functions. Um, part of that is somewhat dependent on the um, design of the electronics package that can vary from one panel choice to another panel choice. Uh, there's things like that are called like the TCON um, that can vary between Samsung and between LG. So there's some factors in there that um, can complicate sometimes having certain types of functionality and features. Um, but right now, I don't believe so. Uh, I'll definitely feedback to our team um, to see what options we could introduce to do that. Um, since this unit does support display widget center, it's possibly maybe we could put in a hook to allow you to maybe more easily toggle the KVM functionality through display widget center. Um, so you could do it through that route. So that's something that we are, I think, already looking at. And again, if there's going to be any updates in that respect, we'll definitely be issuing that as an update within the community so you can find out about that. Um, but just be mindful that, yeah, from a KVM functionality, many other companies don't even offer that within some of their displays. Um, and we were happy to introduce it, but it's not as advanced as our smart KVM, which has even more intelligence built into it and more command options in terms of what you can work with, right? Um, what is the current estimated release date for the Dolby Vision firmware release? I don't want to speak to something that we want to be inaccurate in terms of messaging. So right now, I would just say it's forthcoming. Um, so when we have more concrete information, we'll definitely release that. So um, just stay tuned for an update when it comes to the Dolby Vision firmware update. Um, does the monitor do pixel cleaning? Um, so the best way to handle kind of the pixel cleaning or kind of the OLED care is to use the ROG screensaver function. That actually has multiple levels of functionality built into it from a maintenance perspective. Um, and we felt that's easiest in terms of the user being able to kind of have an option that they can engage. So you can engage that screensaver function either by physically accessing the OSD going into the menu function, turning it on, or you can go into display widget center and you can enable the screensaver from there as well. And that actually has, I believe, three different levels of functionality from a, a quote unquote pixel matrix or an OLED matrix care preventative functionality. So um, that's what I would recommend if you want to make sure that you're kind of taking advantage of utilizing that. Plus there's other OLED care options like taskbar items and a couple other things that if you're not aware, you can attempt to kind of toggle off and on to further help to improve protecting your monitor in the long term when it comes to things like burn in. Okay. Um, all right, guys. So um, overall, that wraps up this week's stream. Thank you guys so much for joining us. You guys stay safe, stay healthy. Best of luck with your builds. Enjoy a great Friday night and have a fantastic weekend. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the PCDIY group. So with that, guys, take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend.
Bye-bye, guys. Take care.